It's been an incredible season so far for the Spartan U.S. National Series. The top Spartan men and women have been battling it out for valuable series points that will decide the overall champion. Today, things go up an extra few notches here in Big Bear, California, as athletes go to war on the first beast course of the championship season. In front of them, 13 plus miles of mountains and over 30 obstacles trying to bring them to their knees. Make no mistake, this is the most critical race of the season thus far. This is Spartan. It's not just a speed, endurance, and strength sport. It is a sport about toughness. And Spartan Laureate! Now the hunt is on. We're here in Big Bear, California for the fourth stop in the Spartan U.S. National Series. The first beast of the year clocking in at over 13 miles. The first mountain race of the season with over 5,000 feet of gain. This course is a monster and today we find out who the true contenders are. Hey everybody, I'm David Magida along with Kevin Donahue. And Kevin, how is this longer, steeper course going to impact the racers today? And these steep climbs at this altitude, it is going to be a lung burning, leg cramping slugfest that we have not seen yet this year. Well, Ryan Atkins ripped control of this series away from Ryan Kempson in the race in Seattle. Does anyone stand a chance of stopping him today? He's so at home in the mountains, it's going to be so hard. He's going to have to run a perfect race, Ryan Kempson is today, and he's going to need help. The mm -hmm. man to do that just might be Robert Killian, who is so eager to play spoiler today. Now, Lindsay Webster, she established herself as the name to beat in this series in Seattle. Does Nicole Merkel have any chance of holding on to her first place in this series? Nicole has the lead, but it doesn't feel like it after all that momentum that Lindsay Webster gained in Seattle. And with Rhea Colbo primed for a great performance, it's going to be really difficult for Nicole to hang on to that lead. Now, all we can say is this is going to be one of the most exciting races of the season, definitely the most challenging course. And for more information on that course and how things will shake out at the finish, the third member of our broadcast team, Steve Hammond. Well, thanks, guys. As you can see behind me, super steep mountains make for a, a phenomenal course. There are steep downs and steep ups. There's 3,500 feet of climbing in the first five miles. That is absolutely brutal, which will really play with them a little bit. Later on in the course, you've got a few obstacles, and then you've got the gauntlet. The gauntlet right at the end, at the bottom of the mountain, at mile 12, that is where it could be a game changer. You've got 10 obstacles where there could be a bunch of burpees. We're going to see what happens. It's going to make for a phenomenal finish. Back to you guys. Well, day of racing out here today at Big Bear Lake, and it's adventure season at Big Bear Lake. Live it up with crisp mountain air and a beautiful alpine lake that's jumping with trout. Off-roading, hiking, and mountain biking trails are waiting to be explored, and wildflowers are creating a gorgeous backdrop for photography. Family adventures abound with zip line action, alpine slides, and even panning for gold. See wonderful wildlife at the zoo or explore history and nature at the Discovery Center. Head to your Southern California mountain lake escape by booking your adventure today at BigBear.com. We're at the start line here. Men are lined up and ready to roll. Kevin, aren't you excited? I'm really excited. One guy I'm excited to see here, too, is Ryan Woods. I'm really impressed that he's here today. His first two races this year were a dumpster fire, say the least, and he got hurt in Seattle. So see him out here today to play spoiler is big time. Now we also see Robert Killian in the mix. Expect to see him trying to push the tempo. He loves these long, grinding courses. But the man to beat today is Ryan Atkins. Ryan Atkins has taken control of this series with a strong performance in Seattle, and he is perfectly at home in the mountains. And he's in the lead right there, as you can see, with the long tights, the uh, long hair right there with the blue kind of uh, back strap around his waist. And that is Mark Battress that is right next to him with the tattoos on his chest there and the long compression socks. Mark Battress, a, a solid marathoner who's transitioned to the sport in the last few years. And we've been waiting to see him emerge as one of the top uh, competitors. He has the running ability, but he hasn't quite put it all together consistently. And this is one of those races, too, where the other series we talked about, there are more flatter races. This is a race that a lot of these mountain runners, like Johnny Lunalima, right there with the orange shoes in front of us with the black shorts, has been waiting for all season. Solid mountain runners have been waiting for a course like this, and a guy who's a solid mountain runner, too, right there with the short black shorts and the headband right in front of us is Ryan Woods. Now, if you look at the names up here in the front, already you're seeing an elite group establish itself just out of the, of the gates on the first climb. Ryan Woods, amazing climber. Ian Hosek, 
This is an ideal course for him. He's just behind Woods right there. He's got the blue belt on as well. And just off to the right behind him, you can see Johnny Luna Lima, Tyler Veerman in the center, and then just in front in the black pants, that was Robert Killian as well. So the best climbers in the field already moving themselves to the front. And Ian Hosek, you just uh, mentioned, won the Mountain Series Beast in Montana just a few weeks ago. So he's primed and ready for this race. And he's a guy, when he's on the course, he's one of the happiest people you ever want to meet and a man who's overcome a lot of tragedy over the last year. So someone who everyone roots for. Now, you can see as they start this steep climb how slow and grinding this thing is going to be. The opening climb, they'll climb oh. in the first Whoa. mile, approximately 1,000 feet of elevation gain, and, of course, hit a few walls along the way. And when they reach the top, there's a sandbag carry to welcome them. These over walls are obstacle number one. The second obstacle that they're going to be approaching next to monkey bars is already 700 feet of vertical gain just to get to obstacle number two. It just shows you how much climbing is here. And for men that you've seen run so fast at the beginning of the other races, running so slow right now just shows you how steep the train is and how much they need to pace themselves. Now, a beast is about covering as much ground as you can as quickly as you can because you have 15 miles. So anywhere that you can run as opposed to walk is going to be critical in this race. And yet, right now, for them, it's going to be about clicking off a tempo and keeping themselves in an aerobic zone because as these hills start to get even steeper, they don't want to become too anaerobic, meaning they don't want the fire and the burn and the exhaustion to kick in in their legs. They want to just keep it where you're just trying to control your breathing. And when you talk about the aerobic zone, for example, you're seeing Mark right here in front of us and Ryan Atkins. They're both wearing watches. Those just aren't watches to keep time. Those are actually keeping their heart rate. Everyone has a heart rate that will tell them when they're getting into or too close to that anaerobic zone that you're just talking about. So this helps them gauge where they're at. But they're also athletes that are tremendously in tune with their bodies. They know what kind of pace they have to keep up before they blow up and go too hard. Now, if you're just joining us, that is Ryan Atkins up in front, followed by Mark Battress and Ryan Woods. This is the opening mile of the Spartan Beast, race four in the Spartan U.S. National Series from Big Bear, California. And these guys are going to war. It's the first Beast race of the season, the most climbing that they're going to get in any race in this championship season. And we just got a good shot there, Robert Killian, who is the 2015 world champion. And the athletes are all just starting to do the power hiking where they're putting their hands on their knees. And you've mentioned before in previous broadcasts about the laws of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. And it, it's certainly one of those things that you want to consider. You could potentially run this entire thing, but you're not necessarily moving faster at a running pace and you're not necessarily being more efficient and one of the keys on a race this long where these guys are going to be running for more than two hours is maintaining your efficiency and saving as much energy as possible as you move through the course so here's ryan atkins right there giving a perfect example of a few strides of that power hike just to save his legs a little bit it's just not saving the legs too. Look at the length of his stride that he's able to pick up as he's doing that. So Ryan Woods was running right next to him, but wasn't really gaining too much ground and went into that power hike himself. Now you can see the difference in the muscles being used as well when you're running versus when you're power hiking. A lot more calves being used when you're doing that run. And when you power hike and you lean in, you're getting more hamstring, but you're also challenging your lower back more and you are taking some risks because you're constricting your lungs and you're breathing as a result. So you wanna stand up to run, to breathe, and you want a power hike to save your legs and it's a back and forth combination. These athletes run against each other so much throughout the year too that you might be, um, if you were a rookie at this stage, you might get a little impatient. You might panic a little bit when somebody passed you this early in the race. Okay, cool. Ryan Atkins right. right there, you know, he got passed by Ryan Woods, but there's no panic in there. He's uh, taking his time. He's just, again, settling into his pace. And that's Aaron Newell sitting in third position with the yellow shirt behind. We saw him in Seattle putting on an amazing show, incredible performance, great climber, also excellent rock climber to boot. Yeah, speaking of rock climbing, Ryan Atkins, again, right there with the long black tights, spent about a week in Kentucky recently uh, climbing in a beautiful gorge. And uh, his rock climbing skills are off the charts, too. And it's, again, what makes him one of the best in the world. So you're starting to see a little bit of a gap form. The, the top climbers in the field trying to pull themselves away and expect to see a couple other names emerge into the second group that pulls with them. Guys like Tyler Veerman, maybe Ryan Kent, but Angel Quintero and Johnny Luna Lima should be pushing their way up towards that lead pack as we start to see some gaps. 
one of the more difficult things that we're actually noticing on this course too is the, the terrain, the ground. It looks very sandy, so not only are they battling to climb up these mountains, but the ground is giving away a little bit. Ground that soft kind of takes away a lot of your power and makes the running that much harder. Also, let's not forget we're running at altitude, and altitude is going to play a tremendous role in this race today. We're starting at about 7,000 feet altitude and rising up to about 8,200 feet at the peak. That's a lot, especially for the guys who live at sea level. Um, having come out here from sea level myself, I can tell you just how much more challenging it is. We describe this feeling of running like your legs are stuck in molasses. And right there, you're seeing Ryan Atkins pulling up on Ryan Woods. Ryan Atkins is one of the greatest descenders in this sport, so he knows that he can allow Ryan Woods to kind of gain a little ground, get into a rhythm, but when they hit those steep descents that are going to be coming up later, that's when Atkins is really going to shine. And the, the, the pure runners in the field, the guys that really like to get up tempo, this is their opportunity. These little short stretches between these climbs, they have to be courageous enough and muster the strength to really push on them to push these little gaps that we have right here. Ryan Atkins, probably one of the best in the world at this. And let's hear a little bit from him. I think just knowing the course and seeing how the, it's so obstacle dense at the end, um, it's definitely gonna make that last, you know, half mile of the course super critical because even though that last half mile um, only is, you know, a few percentage in distance of the race, it could make up for, you know, 10% of the time of the race just because it takes time to get through obstacles and get through carries and things like that. So saving some energy for there is going to be huge, but also um, those are my strengths, the obstacles. And so if I can come into this last gauntlet with a lead, uh, I think that it'll be kind of game over for everyone else. And that's, that's my goal. That's my game plan. Um, get out, push hard, descend fast. Uh, try to break everybody and then just uh, hold on to the end. That was Ryan Atkins just speaking right there. He's sitting in third position right now, but of course he is the leader in your Spartan U.S. National Series in the men's field. And he is a tactician out there on the course, mastering not just the times to go hard and when to hold back, but of course knowing exactly when he wants to, where he wants to be going into each obstacle. You took the words right out of my mouth. That was a great example of the strategy and the intelligence that Ryan Atkins has, as well as a lot of these other athletes, how well planned they are going into these races. They're studying the course maps. They're studying, studying the elevation. They're studying the geography, the temperature, everything about these courses before they go in. They use that in their training, and they certainly execute it in the races. And that's Ryan Woods up in the lead right now. And if you're wondering about Woods, why don't I see him up there in the rankings? Well, race one in the series, he, he received the penalty after finishing in second position. That dropped him to 12th overall in that race. Uh, he followed that up with uh, Failing an obstacle early in the next race of the series that took him out of it, and then he DNF did not finish the race in Seattle because of the hamstring problem. But he is now back to form. You can see that he may not be 100% at his peak fitness, but where he is right now is enough to be leading the field right now at the first climb. He showed a tremendous amount of heart and courage just showing up in Seattle. And this is a man who's a competitor. He wants to get out there and give it his best effort. Just like you said, he can't win the series, but he wants to go out and still win races. And another man who's trying to play spoiler as well, right there again in the black tights, is Robert Killian power hiking up the mountain. Robert Killian is a guy that has never missed the podium at the World Championships. Four podium finishes in a row, including a World Championship in 2015. So that makes him one of the most well-respected and, of course, most accomplished athletes in this field. And Ryan Woods, who we mentioned before, he, of course, is your defending champion in this series. So he has a lot on the line for this race and for the rest of the season. A ton of pride. And back there, we also saw another athlete, as we'll get back to it, as they're attacking the monkey bars. This is at 700 feet elevation, so they've already climbed that high. And this is the first obstacle where you have to test out the grip a little bit and see if there's any moisture on those bars. You see a big pass coming from Tyler Veerman moving into first position right there. And Veerman is a newer to the sport, but he was a collegiate miler, become, becoming currently a stronger mountain runner. And one of the guys that we look at is uh, one of the future stars in this sport. And he's already, he's currently sixth in the points rankings. And in a race like this, you're going to have to take a chance someplace. And it just seems like he took a chance in the first climb of the race. He also took a chance right there, skipping the water, as you saw Ryan Woods in the vet move, 
knowing, okay, it's a long race, let me get my water. Uh, Veerman seems to be taking every second he can get, relishing that opportunity to be up in first position. And that is Aaron Newell in the yellow in third position, and Ryan Atkins sitting in fourth, as we're now starting to see these big separations forming in the field. In most of these races this season, you'll see it, the competitors relatively close together, but the time gaps that you are gonna see at the finish line of this race, because of how spread out they can get on this mountain, those are gonna become very significant. And speaking of your man who could spread it out, right there in the black shirt and the black shorts, that is Chris Brown. He took 10th at the Western States Endurance Challenge. It's a 100 mile run through California in the last few years. So he's a man on a course like this that could do a lot of damage with all the open running they have. So right now you can see Tyler Veerman running on the left, Ryan Woods <laughs> power hiking on the right, and we are approaching the first mile of this race. We may have just hit it at that monkey bar, actually. And they'll be climbing up now. And if you think about it, they're doing all this climbing to get to a very difficult sandbag carry. And the most difficult thing about that sandbag carry is of course that we're doing it at altitude where they'll pick up a 60 pound bag and continue to carry it up the hill as we have second place in the series. That's Ryan Kenson right now. And uh, he's gonna make a statement. We've, we've questioned in the past, can he run with the top contenders in the mountains? If he wants to prove that point today, then yes, he can. Yeah, he's a proud Vermont native who won the Vermont Beast last year, which is one of the most prestigious mountain range races in the Spartan culture. And he wants to take the momentum from that and stick it on this big mountain course. Now he and his brother uh, have a friendly rivalry where they are uh, Matt Kempson and Ryan Kempson thing one and thing two. And thing one goes to whoever's done the most uh, prestigious accomplishments in the last week or two. And right now, it's gotta be Ryan Kempson He's been taking it from his brother all season long with dominant performances in Jacksonville, Alabama, and then nearly having a strong performance in Seattle before a failure on the monkey bars cost him first place in this series. It just shows you how important every single obstacle is. That was the difference between what possibly could have been a second place finish, dropped him all the way back to 10th. Yeah, it was brutal, brutal showing for him for, for that to happen. And you can see a lot of power hiking going on with these athletes. A uh, number of names to look out for as well in the field. Some of the deeper areas. We have uh, Aaron Newell making his move up, trying to seize the lead. And of course, don't be surprised to see some faces like Kirk DeWint and a number of other stars newer to the field, but not new to racing joining us. But that's Tyler Beerman right now up in front as he makes his approach into the sandbag carry. Yeah, there is only a 36 point difference in the standings between fourth place and 10th place for the men. And there's the women's start right here. And if it's anything like any other races, Nicole Miracle will set the tone early on. And she's going to need to because she has to worry about two other women today. Lindsay Webster, who's trying to reclaim the series lead. And of course, Rhea Coble, who won this race last year. And Rhea Coble, who is arguably the greatest uh, ascender, greatest climber in the sport right now. And Lindsay Webster, who is by far the best descender coming down the mountain out of all these ladies. You could say best descender and as well, arguably right. the best climber and the best all around racer. The most accomplished female athlete we've seen in this sport, possibly the most accomplished racer, male or female, Lindsay Ever. Webster. Ever. Yeah. And so now Tyler Veerman's got that 60 pound pack or pound bag on his back as he ascends the first sandbag carry or the sandbag carry. And that's Nicole Miracle on the screen right there. She's your series leader. She won the first two races handily, but a second place finish to Lindsey Webster in Seattle has her nervous right now. It has to be because knowing that race it put a lot of pressure on her because of just what we're looking at now. Lindsey Webster and Rhea Kobo, who are again, like you said, two of the greatest climbers in the sport, are going to try to be hunting her down today to take over the point series. Other faces in the blue, you can see Faye standing, and then to the left is that Rebecca Hammond, yep. I believe, returning after a little Achilles injury that's kept her out for the last few weeks. It has. She's been feeling a lot better, decided to give it a go today. She's a competitor, so we'll see what she has. Now, Rhea Koble, she's excited. She's been ready to get to the mountains. She's a more of an ultra runner, mountain runner. She wants to get out there and grind at a little bit slower tempo, but high heart rate and really challenge everyone's legs. This is her ideal terrain. And that's Leanne Wastini, just to the side to the right of Lindsay Webster, who was in the center. In the gray and yellow top. And uh, Rhea, over the last couple years, if we look at Tyler Veerman still powering up this mountain, 
she has been doing recently a tremendous amount of mountain biking. Eight to 10,000 feet of vertical climb a day and 50 to 100 miles a day. She struggled with injuries from overrunning. I think she's found out that it's great for her to start cross training now. So that's Forrest Bouge right there. Small, compact, former wrestler who has transitioned into this sport. It's interesting to see all the different athletes. That was Robert Killian who went by triathlon champion. And here's Johnny Luna Lima, former collegiate soccer player. So the mix of athletes that you have going head to head here is pretty incredible. And there is our two-time reigning world champion, Lindsay Webster, really starting to establish her pace right now. She looks just very comfortable. She and Ryan race very similarly. They never panic early. They don't go out hard. They run their race. Now for more on what's going on here in this sandbag carry and how things are shaking out, the fourth member of our broadcast team as Ryan Atkins gets ready to make a huge descent, David Watson. Dave, what are your thoughts? Here I am at Sandbag Carry. You can see here Woods, Atkins, Veerman setting a very fast early pace. We're about a mile in and about a thousand feet of gain to this point. These guys are really high heart rate. Uh, the air is very cold. There's even some snow on the ground, but I'm very surprised at the pace that is being set by Veerman at this stage. Thanks a lot, Dave. And it's important to note, Kevin, if you saw how fast Tyler Veerman went out. This is not the course to be just going out really hard, especially given his lack of experience on these longer beast steep courses. And we know he's got the, the ability, but was this a strategic mistake? It, it was a risk. And if it pays off with him, like towards the top of the standings at the end of the race, we'll say, hey, you know, he took his shot and he, uh, it paid off. But if not, he might blow up here and it could cause some serious problems. And that is the big risk, of course, blowing up and um, that's Faye Stenning right there. Faye Stenning is having a little bit of an off year for herself, but she has the talent. She should be in that top five mix pretty, basically any day. And she always has an ability as well as does this Rebecca Hammond that we saw right there. But you know what? The, the athletes on the men's and the women's side have gotten so much better. To consistently be there in the top, you know, eight to ten every single race all year long is still a pretty good accomplishment. Now you can see Ryan Woods starting to make a move past Tyler Veerman. The, the first climb mixed with that sandbag carry may have taken a little bit of a toll on him. But the key is, of course, keeping your heart rate within a manageable range right now. And that's Rebecca Hammond, second place at the North American Championships last year and second place at the World Championships last year. And she was essentially a rookie. It came out of nowhere. One of the questions this year would be, could she maintain that same kind of level of success from the beginning of the national series throughout the entire Spartan season. And it just shows you how hard everything is. She's a great athlete, but she's been battling injuries. Look at Aaron Newell just blowing by Ryan Atkins saying, I don't care that you ran right past me on the downhill of that sandbag carry. I'll take that lead right back. And he is a cocky son of a gun, but that might, that might hurt him later. S sometimes that cockiness or arrogance as an athlete could burn you 10 miles into a race later. A lot of people, they race each other during these events. Ryan Atkins just runs his race, and it's one of the reasons that he's been so successful. It's very easy to get excited and caught up in the battles that are going on. There are little, small battles happening between racers throughout the course. And to run your own pace and stay within your own limitations and your own zone, that's the key to running your fastest possible race. And it seems like the ladies are doing that right now. Rebecca's pace right here is great. She looks comfortable. Her shoulders are back. It doesn't look like she's struggling. And these guys are going at it, and they're playing a lot of those mental games that you are just talking about right now. It's important to note, those at home, you're watching these people walk up the hill thinking how hard can this be. They're miserable right now. Their lungs are on fire, their calves feel like they're exploding, their quads are exhausted, and their hearts are beating out of their chest. This is 180 beats per minute right now climbing this thing. They're, they're right now, when they get to the top of the mountain, as there is the descending of Ryan Atkins, watch him fly down this hill. 
he's going to have one of the stronger descents of the day. Also look for guys like Johnny Lima to be the best descenders out there in the field. Some guys climb fast, other guys descend with world-class ability, and that's Ryan Atkins. What makes a great downhill runner is the ability to have the courage to stride your legs out, to point your shoulders downhill, and actually to bound down the hill a little bit. The shorter and choppier your steps are, the more braking you're doing, and it slows you down. It's safer, but this way that Ryan Atkins is just barreling down the hill is the fastest way to go and takes a lot of guts. It's a, it takes, you have to take some risks. The reality is you can easily trip, fall, and beat it hard, dislocate a knee, you can step in a hole. There's a lot of bad things that can happen. And you see that madman barreling down the hill past everyone. That's Johnny Luna Lima, and he is the class of the field when it comes to the center. You just got a great sense of that. That was about a five to six foot wide ditch, and he just bounded right over it like a deer. So we're back here in the women's field. They are approaching the top of the opening climb of their day as well, where they'll hit the monkey bars and then a little higher up the sandbag carry as well. As Ryan Atkins holds the lead, but Johnny Luna Lima is closing on him. Yeah, and this is going to be a leg burning descent all the way. To, this is one of the steepest climbs going down right through about mile two right now for the men. And that's going to take them down to the seven foot wall where they're going to hit a couple obstacles at the bottom and still some more steep descents. As you can really see the pitch of the hill right there for the ladies. You can, and footwear is going to be so key for those who are new to racing, obstacle races. Footwear is critical because you need something with a solid rock plate that can handle the pounding of all these stones and feet. You can maintain traction and control and the confidence in your legs that your feet will be able to take these corners and handle it and keep you in control at these high speeds. That's a great shot of Leanne Watson right there. She is a, was a great collegiate runner and she took third at the West Virginia North, Re North American Regional Championship last year and is no stranger to this kind of competition. And that had to be the race of her life. She's consistently always in that top six, seven racers, but for her, the goal has been to climb into this upper echelon. And she's making a statement today up there with the lead women. Here go the men starting to climb again. It's going to be like this all day, folks. These short, steep, nasty kickers that just keep coming. You think you're through them, and then another one happens. There are eight climbs in the first six miles of this race and 35 feet of vertical ascent. And that means they have to come down 3,500 feet as well. That sometimes it's just as hard as going up. The descending, what's tough about the descending is you're taxing the legs a lot on the climb. And then on the descent, the only way that you can slow yourself and maintain your control is to use a ton of quadriceps. So the front of those thighs are working really hard. It takes a lot of strength out of them. And then it wears you out for later in the race. As you can see, Johnny Luna Lima all the way up into second position. And he is looking strong. Ryan Wood said, that is a name to watch out for today. He was probably in 10th and 12th place in the sandbag carry. And with that descent down the hill with Ryan Atkins, they just worked themselves up into first and second place. You've got a nice battle going here between Ian Hosek in the front, just beside him, Robert Killian, and right behind Forrest Bouge. Three completely different body types, three totally different types of athletes all going to war on the same course. Forrest Bouge, you talked about him on All-American Wrestler in college. He's probably the greatest OCR athlete that we have that's under five foot six. It's incredible how fast he can run and stay with these guys who have much longer legs. He's uh, very tenacious and longer legs don't necessarily help you out on a mountain like this. Having short legs that can turn over well can be helpful on the ascents, but it's the descents where the long legs can be especially advantageous. As you can now see, Ryan Woods there in third position, Aaron Newell in fourth. Tyler Veerman has fallen back to fifth, but he's maintained contact with this lead group, and that's where he wants to be, anywhere within that lead five. Yeah, if you lose that contact, and what Dave is talking about when he says contact, is being able to actually see the runner in front of you for a significant amount of time. If they get to the top of the mountain and turn the corner and start bombing down the mountain where you can't see them anymore, it's very hard to maintain a pace with them and they could pull away and leave you for the rest of your race. You basically want to latch on. My coaches used to always talk about it as make them your, your, make them your mule. Let them carry you up the mountain. All you got to do is sl slip in behind them and let them set the tempo and you just have to respond. But it keeps you mentally engaged as you climb these big mountains. And that's what Johnny Lunalima just did right behind Ryan Atkins. He's letting him set the pace. And as I say that, Murphy's Law, Johnny has just run out in front of Ryan Atkins. And look at the difference in body positions. You see Ryan Atkins going more at the power hike right now. Lunalima is running. And then back to the power hike. Look who's moving back in the lead, Atkins 
Quicker with the power hike than Luna Lima, but slower on the running climb. And then, of course, you have the two best descenders in this field. They're about to go mano a mano on the next descent. Here's Rebecca Hammond. This is her first opportunity to run this mountain. And Rebecca has already caught some of the back end of the elite runners from the men's division, as most of the ladies do usually early in a course like this. So what we have with uh, Rebecca Hammond is we have to see where her fitness lies. We also have to see where that Achilles lies. The concern, of course, is can it hold up to a 15-mile course? Was this the right race for her to make her return? especially with the season in the national series kind of out of hand for her. We know her A races, of course, are going to be that North American championship and that world championship race. She has her sights set on winning the world championships. Then this is a good barometer for her as well. And being that she is a Harvard medical student, I think she has a good idea of how hard she needs to push herself and when to back off. So back and forth, the power hike, now this tall striding hike. So she's got three different techniques she's alternating between. Power hike when she goes hands to the knees, that's right here. Then when she stands up, she's trying to change those muscle groups. And then if she can get into a little run, that's when things will get a little bit looser for her, but more on the calves at that point. What you'll see a lot of athletes, sometimes they get so tired, they'll start actually going up the hill sideways, Those maybe sometimes tired. backwards, just to engage other muscle groups to let their climbing legs rest for just a bit. I mean, you can see that this is a war. Like right now, these athletes are not allowing anyone to get complacent, to get comfortable. They're pushing each other out of their comfort zones the entire time. And Becca Hammond has decided now's the chance to get a little bit of run and then close some ground. And that's the monkey bars up ahead. She knows she'll be able to catch her breath there. And this is a great spot where you could actually look up the hill and kind of see where the other athletes are at and see who's still in front of you. As we get back now to Johnny and Ryan, who've been playing this kind of cat and mouse. Ryan is taking forth. some kind of nutrition out of his pocket. So Ryan is looking. He, he will allow you to pass him so that he can get his nutrition ready in hand. Maybe there's a water station coming up that he knows about. But, of course, taking that nutrition every 30 minutes, every 45 minutes, depending on the length of the race, can be very important in a race this long. So Johnny is one of the most interesting athletes we have. As you mentioned, he was a collegiate soccer player. He was also on the U.S. under-18 soccer developmental program. It's Leanne Wassley gets across the monkey bars, hits the bell, and gets a little bit more pep in her run. As, let's see, we're back to these two gentlemen, Johnny and Atkins, and getting back to Johnny. So he was on the U.S. developmental soccer team, but he was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil moved to the United States, and when they were very young, him and his sister, they actually moved to Germany. He speaks fluent German as well. So he's a man of many languages and obviously many talents. And you have to assume that that time in Germany helped his soccer game quite a bit. Brazil and Germany are two great places to learn how to play <laughs> soccer. Not too bad. <laughs> as you can see, Becca Hammond makes it through with ease through that monkey bar section. As we're getting a look here at Natalie Miano, who is the wife of Mark Batris, who is also high up there in the women's standing and looking to make a statement today herself. He's also her coach. And it, it doesn't hurt to have a great runner like him as your coach. But Natalie has gone from relative unknown to serious contender in a matter of just a year and a half or so. And that's Faye Stenning waiting for her opportunity. But she hasn't been able to put it together in this year. I tell you what, if you just go, saw her going through the monkey bars too, you saw the pitch of the monkey bars. Not only were those bars far apart, but they were also going uphill. And so again, you see another pass. Aaron Newell moving into second position behind Johnny Luna Lima right there at first. Ryan Atkins sitting in third. And you're going to see these passes back and forth for a while until these gaps start to form a little bit. But look at that stride as they finally found one flat piece of running. I tell you what, that's a, that's a place where Johnny could actually start to make a move to put a little distance on Ryan Atkins because he is a better flat distance runner. And Ryan Atkins is quite a flat distance runner. I think the other day he did a self-time just on his own 5K and I think the time was 15.42, just running for fun. And he doesn't train a lot of speed. So for him to just be able to do that naturally alone with no one pushing him, not on the track, but out on the trails, pretty impressive. If you could see the explosion that Ryan and Johnny just flew over that wall with, and now watch him hammer down this hill. I think Luna Lima might put 30 seconds on him on this descent. And Ryan is essentially, besides Johnny, the best descender in the field. But, I mean, you're, you're fighting basically one of the best descenders in the world in Luna Lima. I, I mean, it, it's just incredible to see him run that fast out of an obstacle like that after doing all that climbing. The quad strength it requires is incredible. 
as it's, uh, I believe, a man in the dough just right behind Natalie Miano. We saw both of them at the Spartan Combine last year duking it out. Impressive athletes. Yeah, to be a, a great Spartan athlete, you got to be able to do everything. And that Spartan Combine you talked about had a, a lot of like heavy lifting involved into it and a ton of anaerobic stuff. So it's great to see that the range they have to be very anaerobic and here very aerobic. I think this is these climbs are a perfect example of an exercise that is both aerobic and anaerobic as in muscular and cardiovascular because you're breathing so hard out of your chest, but you're also your legs are hurt. And this descent right now by Johnny Lularino is something else. He is running ungodly fast down this hill. Reckless abandon is a good way to describe it. And let's see how far the gap has formed with him and Atkins. The quad strength that this requires is really out of control. And the courage. It's just, it's, it is a skill to have that much guts to run that fast down the mountain. It takes a lot out of you as well, so the impact it can have on his climbing, he must be very confident in his ability to run his downs and his ups without fatiguing himself too much. Part of the confidence is to know that you can go that fast, and then if you have to put on the brakes and quick step a couple like undulations on the ground, to be able to have that ability, <coughs> pardon me, is very important. The quick foot movement that he gained from soccer comes into play right there. So right now, again, that is a man in the dough. Natalie Miano is there climbing. You can see them passing some of the men, the stragglers from the first wave of the day in the men's field. And you can see that Nado is wearing that Canadian headband right now. As Ryan Atkins, look how far ahead Johnny Luna Lima has gotten from him already. That's incredible. Atkins basically never gets out downhill. I've never seen him get smoked like that in a downhill, ever. <laughs> These women are just about to hit the sandbag carry. They're going to round this corner, and then there's this W shape. Tell us a bit about how this is layout is set up. What's great is it's a half pipe for the ski resort. So it, the start of the climb goes all the way up to the top of the half pipe. So the athletes that are entering the half pipe can see who's already in the sandbag carry inside the pipe. So then they get to come down the hill, pick up the sandbag, and then carry it through the center of that half pipe that we're looking at. And it's kind of like a, an army of ants. You can see where everybody's at and get a great gauge for where you are in the race. And that's Ryan Atkins right now trying to hang on to that second place position, trying to claw Luna Lima back. We've got a long descent in front of us. This is what Luna Lima was hoping for, an opportunity to open up and stride out for an extended period. And what you're seeing now, it's not a, a gator, it's not a dune buggy trial following these guys. These are world-class ultra runners that are following them. Peter Fan, Rick Floyd, Pat Parcell, J.P. Donovan, and our very own Steve Hammond are out there chasing these athletes from Rofros. Some of the best trail runners out there, they're going to be struggling just to keep up. It's they, as athletes now, have just hit Olympus. Johnny Little Lima's through Olympus, and that's Ryan Atkins working incredibly quickly across Olympus, and that's that rock climbing back down. Yeah, it's a little downhill, but again, for them to move that fast and that quickly through there with their heart rate that hard is very hard to do because if you make a mistake, 30 burpees there would be devastating. That was Rose Wetzel sighting we had right there. Rose from Seattle, of course, having a baby in the last couple years and working her way all the way back to being a top five female contender. It's pretty incredible. Well documented, and she was in the, the pink shorts there, if you saw. And right here is Rhea Coble coming up the sand, center of the sandbag there. And right behind her, I believe that was the Cole Miracle. I only caught a glimpse, but Rhea wants to just put the hammer down on these athletes early, and that is the Cole Miracle. And the question is, where's Lindsay Webster? And that is Lindsay Webster right there in third place. So the women are in a cluster right there up at the sandbag carry. And Ryan Atkins, Lindsay Webster's husband, running out there in front. Yep, we got com confirmation. Lindsay Webster indeed looking very comfortable, not looking concerned at all that she's sitting in third position. She's in a good place when you're running downhill in the sandbag carry. There she goes. And so Lindsay making her way down the hill. Look for her to make a pass on the next climb. You got a good idea too of the, the, the ground. It was very shady right there, and there was big rocks all over the place. So not are they trying only trying to navigate down this hill, but they're also trying to skip over and miss those rocks and just break their ankles. Now this is a new obstacle we saw for the first time in Seattle. That was pipe layer with Johnny Luda Lima sitting in first position, Ryan Atkins approaching it in second. And this climb is a nasty one. There's a big steep ascent to start. It levels out momentarily and then kicks up again for a second nasty climb over this ascent. And they really picked up a lot of energy running down that hill because just now he's just going into that power hike and he's moving pretty fast. 
And if, they're going to slow as they ascend up this thing. This is going to take a lot out of their legs muscularly, and that's Rebecca Hammond right now. Second place at World Championships last year, second place at North American Championships last year. And coming off that Achilles injury, she's just trying to hang on. If you're just joining us and you're asking why and who are they passing on this course right now, these were athletes that were in the back end of the men's elite wave that they're already blowing past just a little over a mile into the course with a 15 minute head start on them. Look at Luna Lima just running for that section for a moment and then getting back to that power hike. He's gonna alternate back and forth, try and conserve energy, but put as much distance between himself, not just in Atkins, but really he knows he's in a two-man race right now. They're trying to bury the rest of the field. And that is just one of the first of the eight climbs in the first six miles of this race. And have so much more to go. So it was really important that he went into that hike. As you can see, Tyler Bierman now pop out of pipe layer. He's still hanging in there. He is. He's in third position. Fourth place, that was Ian Hosek. And here you go. Five, six, Angel Quintero, <laughs> Ryan Kempson, and Aaron Newell all making themselves known. I'm here as Forrest Bouge and Robert Killian now also leap out of pipe layer. So that is kind of that, that, that lead pack that's fighting for third place right now with these guys ahead. Mm -hmm. And Ryan Woods, don't count him out, he was in pipe layer at that moment too. So really, when you're talking about just a matter of a few seconds, that is a chase group. You have your leader out on the course, Johnny Luna Lima. You have chase number one, that's Ryan Atkins. And you have chase group two, everybody else that we just mentioned all working together to try and pull him back and as you just mentioned there's ryan woods right there that's height trying to catch up to the back part of that second group and that, that second cluster. group is so important because the points that they could gain by every single spot are huge some of those guys are going to end up leaving here with 50 more points than the others and it might be only separated by a few seconds and we talked about it there's only 36 points separating fourth place from 10th place in this series. Coming out of the sandbag carry, Nicole Miracle looks smooth. Up ahead of her, I believe, is Rhea Kobel. Lindsey Webster just behind. And this is a tough climb because you just tax those legs so much on that sandbag carry. But I got to say, Lindsey Webster looked like she was moving much quicker. And if you just saw her face right there, much more relaxed. Very relaxed. Although you never see much from Nicole and her face. She doesn't give much away. She's very stoic. And there is a good look at Lindsay Webster right there. Again, she is the reigning two-time world champion in Spartan, as well as the defending U.S. National Series champion. Multiple times over for that as well. And here you go, an opportunity for descent. So she's been a strong descender in the past. The one who hasn't been is up in front of her, Rhea Coble. Rhea Coble has not done a lot of damage on descents in the past. And you can see that Lindsay Webster is going to try and make moves past Nicole Miracle and try and establish first place position by the time she gets to the bottom of this hill. She caught her in the time that you were just talking about. It. Yeah, it's it's going to be impressive. And a lot of things is when you look at the difference in, in skill sets, a lot of it is that uh, the background that they come from. Nicole Miracle was originally at one point a track athlete. That was her goal was to become an Olympic track and field athlete. And Lindsay's been more in the mountains, more running around outdoorsy over her career, although Nicole's done plenty of that as well. She's newer to it. Rayo, again, it's very well documented, was on the Slovenian national gymnastics team. And there goes Lindsay Webster now blowing past Rhea and Nicole Miracle. So she is now in the lead well, with I that see, descent. I see Nicole Miracle there. Lindsay, uh, Rhea Coble is still just a hair in front of her, but she'll gobble her up before they get to the bottom of this climb. And you're seeing the different undulating the ground. Now they just went from dirt to grass. You can't really see what's in the grass. So it takes a lot of car trees, ladies, to run down that fast. A lot of, lot of divots, a lot of crevasses that run across this where water that washes through because they have this, these crazy uh, snow-making irrigation systems throughout this area. You have all these crevasses where runoff is happening, and you have to leap and jump over those. Not to mention, it's an active mountain bike mountain right now, and they have these mountain bike trails that are cutting across as well. There's your men's leader, Johnny Luna Lima, ascending the second really major climb of this course. It's probably his fourth climb overall, but this is the second really huge one. If and he just wants to look to his right, yeah, to get some of that view, to get a little energy. And you can see the gap between him and Atkins now. That's got to be about 30 seconds. It's significant. I mean, he's put, he put a lot of that gap on the downhill, but he seems to be putting more gap on the climb, which is shocking. 
and you could tell how steep this course is. The ladies are literally going down into their hands at certain points just to keep their balance on that hill. This this turnaround right here is incredibly steep, and you just saw that Nicole Merkel has also caught Rhea Coble, which tells you Lindsay outran both of them on the downhill, but Nicole also outran Rhea significantly. Okay. Rhea's going to need to become more aggressive on those downhills to have a chance. Yeah, she competes with these women at the championship events. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if there is a little bit of fear there because she is coming off, you know, a foot injury from last year. And I know that was a big problem when she went to the, the Utah U.S. National Series races. You could see how steep it is for some of these men. Hands on the ground steep. This is one of the nastier climbs of the course as well for the women. They've got a number of really tough 400, 500 foot elevation gain climbs just sprinkled in there as well as that original 1,000 footer that did a lot of damage. Once you tax those legs with that anaerobic pressure, it's very, very hard to get the legs to respond and come back to you. Even if they do, the fatigue factor that's set in, the numbness that could set in as a result, where you feel like you're just running on dead heavy legs, it all plays a role. So this is that section where it softens up for a moment, and then there'll be another kicker for Johnny Lunalima in a moment. As we watch Leanne Wasley getting up into that part of the climb, another thing that you wouldn't really think about too is with those really fast descents is the pounding on the bottom of their feet. If their socks and shoes aren't fitting perfectly, but they get a little bit of gravel, a little bit of dirt into the inside of their shoes, it could create blisters that could cause agonizing pain for the entire duration of the race. And these are the dig divots we were talking about. You can see this terrain, all the divots, all the holes, all of these things when you're running downhill, those become hazards. And this is a place where that, that sand and that dirt just fall into your shoes and cause so many problems later. These athletes work on so many different aspects of their, not only their nutrition, but their equipment, just to prevent just little things like that. So Leanne Waston is doing hands on hips. She's trying to keep her chest proud. That's just to maintain as much oxygen flow into her lungs as possible. If she doubles over in this position that you see right here, that's when you start to lose that ability to expand your lungs and you start to get some of those diminishing returns. Another thing that's going to burn their lungs, we talk about the sediment getting into their shoes. When you're walking up and hiking up these hills and athletes are in front of you, the dirt and the sediment that they're kicking up gets into the air, you actually start to breathe it in. So over time, it really starts to burn their throat. It makes every breath sometimes an agonizing part of this race because even the breathing hurts on top of the, the lung burning from the actual you know anaerobic stuff. It's just, it's, it's hard. Johnny Luna Lima holding that lead over Ryan Atkins and although you only see about 25 meters of gap between them, it's so slow and grueling that it's actually like a 20 second lead. And what he's doing to Ryan Atkins right now is showing him, hey, I'm, I'm here to play. I'm here to put the pressure on you. And it's forcing Ryan Atkins to maybe work a little bit harder than he normally would be working with if he had a lead. It's possibly true. I mean, Atkins has said, we have him on record saying, I want to get into that festival area at the end, that, that obstacle heavy gauntlet finish in first position because then I know the race is over. Now, if he's chasing, he knows I need to stay close enough that I can use those obstacles to my advantage, close in, and steal the win. And some of those obstacles are so heavy. There is going to be a very difficult plate drag coming up the way it's set up, followed by a very difficult bucket. And those are two obstacles that a Ryan Atkins is very adequate at, more than adequate at. And a place where, if he's close to Johnny Luna Lima, could possibly steal the race. As you see him bounding down the hill again as he's barreling down. It's incredible. He's leaping. He's running with incredible speed, but also, He's taking a lot of risks here. And risks are what he needs. He knows that over the course of 15 miles, Atkins is just gonna keep charging at him. But you can see the difference, the gap on the downhill versus the gap on the uphill, it's dramatic. You get a much better sense of how far apart they actually are. And Ryan Atkins is starting to lose his contact with Luna Lima. And if you just saw that last leap that he made over that ditch, again, he looked like a deer bounding over a stream. It's incredible how much hang time and how much air he allows himself to get. Leanne Wassini making her way up, really climb number three on the day. This one's one of the longer climbs. We've seen the men already got through this one, but she's got the biggest climb yet to come 
beyond this one coming up next. So a big descent after this floor, and then the big climb that you just saw Atkins and Lima really take. As you can see, Atkins pushing as well, but he doesn't have that same knee lift in the front on this descent. He's not running with that same aggressive stride that Luna Lima is. No one is, really. Well, he's an aggressive guy. One of his favorite movies is The Hunger Games. So, uh, let the odds be in his favor as he runs down this hill. So again, Leanne Wastany making that push, trying to stay in that top five, trying to make, maintain contact with that lead group. Of course, women's leaders, Lindsey Webster, sitting in first position. Second position, Nicole Merkel now, and last year's winner on this course, Rhea Copel in third, and that's Ryan Atkins trying to claw back Johnny Luna Lima. Ryan Atkins wants to hold on to that series lead that he's got here. And Ryan Atkins has made a history of coming back in races. We don't have to go as far back as uh, Tahoe in 2018, where he was kind of way back in fourth or fifth place and worked his way back all the way into second and almost overtook first place for the world championship. The amazing thing about Ryan Atkins is his ability to just continue to click off a tempo, high pace, high tempo, for such a long period of time, he just never seems to run out of gas. And it seems like he always knows when to turn it on when someone else in front of him is just starting to fade. And out of nowhere, he comes and just steals a race. And you could see Wastany right there, just for a moment, shifting her hips into a little side shuffle just to try and regain a little bit of energy, and then boom, Another shift right here, back into running technique, even if it's only for 10 seconds, and then back to a walk again, just to continue to move forward and just make progress, change the muscle group she's using, as Luna Lima is now running straight up this steep, nasty climb. It was really cool what you see him do. He was popping his legs. He was actually running with some power, trying to get as far as he could. And what a lot of times what the athletes will do is they'll pick a spot. Like, we're looking at these trees to the side of them, right? So they'll pick something out in front of them, say, you know, I'm going to power hike to that tree or to that pipe or to that little berm, and then I'm going to get into a run. And then, okay, there's a snow field in front of me. I'm going to run up to that snow field, and then when I get up there, I'm going to start hiking again. So or I'm going to count to 20, and I'm going to power hike for 20 steps, 20 seconds, and now I'm going to run for 10 seconds, and this alternating back and forth keeps you in a rhythm, keeps you moving, keeps you focused on holding that tempo. And that's gonna be one of the things. Maintain your tempo and not get complacent because you're in so much pain, you're in so much discomfort, but you've gotta keep pushing. It gives you a game plan and when there's nobody around you, and Leanne, right, you said, she's probably in fourth place right now. She's right around there. And she, if, she, if she cannot see the other athletes, it's a great way for her to maintain that pace necessary to keep herself in the race. What a shot of Big Bear Lake that we had right there. And, um, certainly one of the most beautiful venues we've hit all year if you look out over that course. It's a beautiful venue that these athletes fear all year long. They still had... PTSD from the race here last year and in the starting corral this morning they were talking about how much pain they went through the year before. Look at Johnny Luna Lima up there in the front. He's out sprinted the photographer who can't keep up. We're talking world class trail runners. Can't even stay with him to get that footage. We have one down there with Ryan Atkins right now. Luna Lima is just in a class of his own today. And we're getting our first look at Rebecca Hammond in a little while, who still seems to be moving with the same kind of cadence she was working with before. And uh, again, if they could just take a quick peek behind their right or left shoulder to see that leg, it's going to give them a lot of energy. Just a beautiful spot. She gets some applause from some of the athletes on course, which is very much part of the Spartan way. Her leg has looked like it's responded pretty well so far to the climbing. You know, I, it, one has to wonder if it can handle all the descents as well. but. But right now, honestly, she looks pretty good. I'm, I'm excited for her season toward the end of the year. Yeah, and Achilles is a funny thing, especially when you get into climbs like this. As you can see with Johnny Luna Lima right here, how much his heel drops back onto the course. That puts a tremendous amount of stretch on the calves, the gastroc, the soleus, and, of course, that Achilles tendon that Rebecca is nursing right now. Especially when he shifts into that run. And right now, that power hike allows him to just continue to click off without putting too much pressure on those Achilles and those calves. As we just saw with, with Johnny, too, and Rebecca, there are these little holes. They're almost like gopher holes all over the course. So it just shows you the amount of, you know, the kind of courage you have to have 
to run down these things because at any moment a foot could go in that hole and you could have a disastrous injury. And it's also just rhythm breakers. Rhythm breakers on the uphill, rhythm breakers on the downhill. One of the things that makes obstacle racing so much different than just road running, trail running, is the, the rhythm breaking in so many different ways, not just from the terrain, but you've come across an obstacle. It's not just the fatigue of that obstacle, it's the breaking the rhythm of your run. It's having to use muscles in your hips and your groin, and all of a sudden having to re-engage and get back up to tempo as a runner. All of these things make it more difficult to just than just going out for a run. Just that obstacle that we saw that was pipe layer. After running, you know, down the mountain, you get to that obstacle. All of a sudden, you have to compress your legs a little bit. You have to start engaging your arms. Those muscles in the upper body need oxygen to be able to work. And then all of a sudden, you're a little bit more tired than you were before. Like you said, the rhythm is broken. You got to go up a monstrous hill again. Dude, we're climbing black diamond ski slopes right now, and. I don't know if you noticed that right in the back corner of the previous shot, but that was Ryan Atkins just starting to close in again on Johnny Luna Lima. He just holds that steady tempo and just he never stops coming. If Johnny Luna Lima wants to maintain this league, he's going to have to fight for it the entire race because Ryan Atkins is not going to let him go. As you see, he's still right maintaining there. that contact. And he's just right there, and lurking is a good way to describe it. He's always lurking. And Luna Lima's got a good pace right now. Like He looks comfortable. He doesn't look like he's out of his element. He looks like he's in exactly where he wants to be. But at the same time, you can never be comfortable when, when Atkins is behind you. You're always a bit nervous. He was a midfielder when he played soccer. And he was also a defender. And right now, he's doing his best job trying to defend this lead against Ryan Atkins. Look how steep that is. Well, that's going to be the top of this climb. And as Luna Lima rounds it, he's going to get an opportunity to stride out and go fast. That's Ryan Woods. He loves this terrain. This is his ideal terrain. That's Becca Hammond over the six-foot wall. That was actually a seven-foot wall, and that was textbook. If you saw her explode into it, get a foot right into the center of the wall so she could just kind of boost up and get her hands over so that once she started to boost over, her shoulders were already over the top, and she was able to pop right over. And now we're seeing some good speed for her coming down the hill. Luna Lima now on Twister, one of the more complex obstacles, opting to go with the reverse technique. It's bicep heavy, but if you could keep looking backwards, continue to look where your objective is, where your goal is, it allows you to get through it quickly and relatively safely as well. And that was uphill, and it was a very core dominant move that he used there. And that's kind of like one of the make or break points of this race, because after this, you're gonna hit a flat section, a flat loop, and he's really gonna be able to turn on the running a little bit more without all the hills. It's gonna be a great chance for him to finally find a rhythm. Becca Hammond testing that Achilles on the downhill, but look at Luna Lima. That's how you run a downhill. Holy smokes. Just the, his knee drive, his lift, his explosion. It's pretty incredible. And we're seeing the same thing with Rebecca Hammond right there as she's striding down the hill, just blowing past people, taking as little steps as possible, but gaining incredible ground while she does it. If Johnny is running the downhill right now at that speed while all of his competitors are still climbing, the separation between them is going to become so significant over this next climb, especially during a 13-mile race. Huge. As you can see, Ryan Woods thrilled to be off that big climb. And Luna Lima just finished the eight-foot box and another climb. This course is relentless. 13 climbs in this course. 13. See, looking back, trying to spot where Ryan Atkins is. But again, more separation because of that downhill. Hey, what's up? And here we go. Now we saw where Luna Lima was on Twister. It's got to be at least a minute and a half to two minutes back right now to Ryan Woods. Different technique, hand over hand, Tarzan swing style. This move takes a tremendous amount of grip because as you're swinging out, that backhand almost wants to pull off the bar. So Ryan has to use a tremendous amount of grip here, but it's a very fast way to get across and it allows him to use the least amount of handholds. And that's right behind him. Uh, you saw Aaron Newell. You also saw Ian Hosek. I think Hosek, this is the race of his year right now. Ian Hosek, I can tell you, again, he took first place at the Mountain Series Beast in Montana a few weeks ago. And he's been on fire since then, and he's really carrying into this race. 
And that is Ian Hosek in the black long tights and Aaron Newell in the yellow shirt. And look at it, Tyler Bierman is still hanging on. As with well as Angel Quintero. Angel Quintero lives at altitude in Mexico and took second in this race last year. So look for him to possibly make a move later in the race. And it looks like that is Robert Killian right behind him, still hanging in. And, and it is Bruges. definitely far as Bruges over on the right. You could tell by his height and how quickly he's moving through there with those powerful wrestling arms. So Quintero was a champion steeplechaser. So you have a steeplechaser, a triathlete, and a wrestler all going to war right now. Same pace at this point, five plus miles into the race. That's pretty incredible. Really is, as we're seeing Rebecca Hammond against picking off a lot of the elite men as she battles her way back into the uh, the front part of this left. race. Yeah. Um, so the women race is probably, you could say, three and a half miles in. The men are sitting at about five miles uh, in. I'm gonna, you still have uh, seven and a half miles now, to go for And then I'll follow on, on the three mile loop around. There's a lot to go. So. And that's where we're going to start to see if the risks that Aaron Newell, that Tyler Veerman took early on are going to start to show their diminishing returns. It's not the start of the beast that matters. It's how you finish the beast. And of course, the beast is one of those races where the last five miles feels like an eternity. And with that gauntlet, you could feel perfect for the first 11 miles. And you could get to the bottom of that mountain and have completely everything fall apart on you. Wheels could come off, everything could cramp, and it could be the most difficult half mile of your life. Don't be surprised to see a lot of cramp city going on in this race right here. And that's Chris Brown. Chris Brown is fighting his way into this race. He's not great on the obstacles yet. He's trying to learn as best he can, but you can see him struggling, kind of using multiple techniques right there, trying to figure it out. But he just does not have the obstacle game that everybody else has. But for somebody to come in with his running background, if he sticks with it, he's going to be a force in the sport. Well, a champion trail runner, and the big thing with being a champion trail runner is this is the kind of race that's ideal for you. There are other courses that the obstacles play more of a significant role. This is a course where the obstacles are present, but that the real significant role is the mountain. How quickly can you get up and down it? And you can see that took more out of him than the run itself. Yeah. He's like, thank God I'm back to running. You saw the relief on his face right there? That was an obstacle that he failed in Seattle, and it was a breath of fresh air for him to get there. As Rebecca Hammond continues to fly down this course like the great mountain runner she is as well. Rebecca Hammond coming from a track background as well. She said last year, quote, I'm not really a great sustained climber. That's not really my thing yet. I've got to learn how to do that. And yet somehow she managed to take second at World Championships in what is a serious sustained climbing course out in Tahoe. She's someone who is dialed in on exactly what her plan is for the rest of the year. So for her to come out with a small injury and take on this race, just shows you kind of where her head's at. I really think this is a barometer for Tyler, where she feels, like, where she wants to be when we get to Tahoe. Yeah, because you know that she wants to make that Tyler her race of the year. This is Kirk DeWitt out of Wisconsin, and, and Kirk, or Minnesota, excuse me. And Kirk is uh, also famous not just for being a fantastic athlete, but also for starring on numerous seasons of The Bachelorette. Yep, and Kirk also owns his own personal training business in Minnesota. Helps a lot of people get ready for Spartan races. And is currently tied with Johnny Luna Lima for fourth place in the series right now. And Johnny Luna Lima is putting some damage on him right now in the points if he could maintain that pace. Now that's Ryan Kent is finishing. Ryan Kent is not happy with where he is in this race right now. You know that he needs to be further up, wants to be further up. And he won the Nationals Park race last week in Washington, D.C., and it's possible that a flight across the country and a flight back this week didn't do him any favors. Um, he's been training very hard in the mountains, so you know he's not thrilled with this day, but he's put together an unbelievable season thus far. And right behind him was Mark Batras, another guy that we expected to see a little bit further up in this field. And you can see right there, Rebecca Hammond came out of that pipe layer. She was breathing really, really heavy and immediately had to go to her knees. Just the action of using those arms a little bit differently took a lot of wind out of her and like you said, broke her rhythm. So this is the kind of race where when you leave the next day, when you wake up, you feel so incredibly sore in your calves, your hammies, your glutes because they're overworking so hard. There's so much more muscular engagement than there would be just on a traditional running course. And that they're out there just hammering at such a slow speed, but so much time under tension for those muscles. I can imagine a lot of them are gonna go down to Big Bear Lake 
when this is all over and take a nice cold dip to try to reduce some of that inflammation. This is views right now of that third big climb that we saw uh, earlier that Luna Lima and Woods climbed up with such ferocity. And that's what Rebecca Hammond is on right now. It's incredibly steep, as you can see, Luna Lima now really on his fifth big climb of the day. Just cresting it, too. And immediately back up to a run. Look at that. It's incredible. <laughs> I, I couldn't imagine running at this point, and I love running in the mountains. If you could look at his headband there, too, his headband has the Brazilian flag on it. He's a very proud Brazilian. He's a proud immigrant, moved to the United States as a kid. His father works for a tech company, so they moved to Germany. So then he lived over there, speaks fluid German, and he's such a proud American. He was so happy to represent the U.S. national team and he's so proud to represent the United States for Spartan Race. So it's just truly like a fun, cool American story unfolding in front of our eyes right now because this has been something when he stopped playing soccer that has been a mission in his life to be a fantastic Spartan athlete. Well, when you've been an athlete your entire life, you have an identity as an athlete. When you feel like you've lost that identity, you're searching for something else. And Johnny has certainly found that here with Spartan Race. Um, it's exciting to see him reaching his full potential today because this is definitely five miles into the race. That's it. The most complete race we've seen him put together in his career as he is running away from the field. And that includes series leader Ryan Atkins. You talk about, you know, finding yourself as an athlete against Spartan Race and then obstacle course racing has become like kind of the ultimate second chance sport, right? We've had people that have, you know, suffered from an economic crisis, people who struggle with drug addiction, people who have struggled with injury, people who are world-class athletes in one area and then couldn't be there anymore and came into this. And it's given them that opportunity to fill that part of their soul up again. And that's why the sport has become so popular. The pace again that Luna Lima's clicking off. Everyone else is looking up at him and trembling, thinking, is this what we're about to face at Tahoe at World Championships? I sure hope not, because he is bringing it. And that's Becca Hammond right now, trying to get up this next ascent. She's got a long way to go. I mean, even in the men's race, we're talking seven miles to go. And what's cool about this is because when you're running the way the ladies did, you get to pick off all these men going up the mountain. It's almost like playing a video game. Every time you pick up somebody off, it's almost like getting a point. It's like a point in your head, and it starts to build up. It starts to build that positive energy. So as she passes all these people, it's kind of giving her extra motivation as she goes. And you can see just how miserable everyone is out there on the mountain. There are some courses where you run and you're just having a great time. And there are some courses where you're out there and every step is just such a labor. As you can see, Johnny trying to maintain that running momentum and he just can barely get the feet to put one in front of the other to climb this ascent. I mean, like we said in the opening, this is a slugfest. This is like being in a 15 round fight where every time you throw a punch, somebody else is hitting you in the face. And for him to put in all that work and just see the five mile marker a couple of minutes ago has to be like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Did you see that <laughs> momentary? More of this? Did you see that momentary look around? The cameraman took a little pan glanced back and we saw Ryan Atkins in the distance and again he's falling further behind. We thought oh there should be a moment where he starts to gain but Luna Lima is punishing everyone out there today. The, the, he's a big fan of the Hunger Games and right now I think he's starting to smell blood in the water and going after it. There are there are a couple different ways that you can run. There's running, there's running like you're chasing someone and there's running like you're being chased and I always say the fastest form of running is the running where you feel like you're being chased and right now he doesn't just feel like he's being chased he feels like he's just breaking everyone he's just wings on your feet when you run in first position there's something special that it does for you it's just like in the Tour de France where the guy is riding the yellow jersey and maybe they're not even supposed to be there in first place but the yellow jersey gives them just that extra like superpower there's something about running in first position where you have an added layer of confidence and an added layer of desire to just get more from your body and this is a stage he's been waiting for all season a mountain beast that is long that is hilly at altitude and he picked a 
day that it has absolutely perfect weather to run. It's just cool enough where you're not going to overheat, but not so cold where your hands are going to freeze up on any of these obstacles. And everywhere where there's a momentary reprieve from that steep kicking incline, he finds a way to get the legs moving and stride out just a little bit. And here comes another incline again. We had a momentary flat like we talked about earlier. Those little sections so critical in today's race, that's where you can continue to really grow these time gaps. And as you looked at Johnny, the cameraman panned back again, and there was no sign of Ryan Atkins as Rebecca Hammond just gave a high five to Mac Roche, who is the champion on the champion team for the Spartan Ultimate Team Challenge a few years ago, and one of the better short course obstacle course racers in the world, giving his shot at a mountain beast. And believe it or not, that is Mac Roche's real hair. It is. He's not that blonde though, that was dyed. Now it's important to note that as we go into this next series of, of trails, a lot of flat running on their way. They're actually going to hit some flat stuff. It's going to get fast, and you're going to see these guys dropping into sub six mile pace for the next few miles. There's a lot of slight decline downhills and a lot of flat. Yeah, I'm, I was just impressed too with uh, with Johnny how he was able to explode up an eight foot wall, considering how much. You know, how much his calves must have been blowing up at that point. And you can see this is another one of those long sections where it levels off momentarily, you catch your breath, and then up in the distance, you thought you were done climbing, there's another climb. The mental grind of this course is as much as the physical, as this is a preview of part of the trail race that Spartan will be having tomorrow, Spartan Trail Series that has launched. One of those things that if you haven't done one, you should dial into it, try it out. It's an opportunity to do something different with Spartan, bring in a whole different audience of people as well. And that is Luna Lima just blowing away everyone else in the field on this descent. And Chris Brown, going back to the trail series, Chris Brown will actually be running a lot of those trail races and he'll be doing it tomorrow as well. So this section right here, you can see a lot of the flat, you can see this light descent, and of course, Luna Lima way off in the distance, so fast that we could barely keep a camera on him. The cameraman was cutting the course so he could try to keep up with him once he gets to that spot. And now he's able to kind of pick him up again as you see him running across. Oh, but just barely. Yeah, I mean, I Luna mean, Lima's like, moving that fast. He's taking a shortcut. You know, he has the angle on him, and he still can't keep up with him. Well, I mean, this is a mountain race, and Luna Lima's making a turn and heading up what looks like to be another small ascent of some kind. But for the most part, expect to see rollers and a lot of flat and a lot of descending over the next few miles. We're going to look here now at some of the thousands of athletes that we have competing on this mountain today. And it's just not the elite level athletes we were watching, like Brian Atkins right there is turning the corner. There's a tremendous community of, of open class runners that are coming out here today and this race might be the greatest adventure they ever have in their lives because it's that daunting of a course. Now this is about a uh, three quarters of a mile long descent as you can see Luna Lima now in the woods in the deep stuff. And, I mean it's a wild tumultuous rocky descent and he'll actually have another climb here but it's very easy fast runnable climb as he hits the bottom of this and kicks up you barely even feel it i ran that section today actually you barely even notice it because you've been running downhill so long you feel like gold when you get to the bottom uh, you feel like you're floating and uh it's crazy to say that considering how much that that camera was bouncing up and down it just shows you how rough it is still these athletes have been racing for like over an hour and they're only they were only about five and a half ish miles in now the next few miles they're going to cover at six minutes a mile maybe quicker they're not at maximum speed because of the damage they've done to their legs at this point as you can see six mile marker right there but the next few miles will be flat fast almost like fire roads and they'll have an opportunity to stride out and gobble up a huge section of this course it, it could be very tempting to get to an area like this and just kind of get to a nice jog and set a decent pace 
And when they knew that got to this part of the course, they would actually have to drop the hammer down and go as fast as they could, knowing they had still so much more after that because you have to make up time someplace. Does Ryan Woods look tentative to you with that hamstring still? Because I think he's not 100% yet. Still running up near the lead of the men's race, but he looks like he's not really opening up that stride on the descent. And he's never been one to take a lot of downhill risks. He knows he has the ability to catch people on the climbs. But still in the thick of things, but you can see the spread is so much more dramatic than where it was early in the race. Yeah, kind of like Forrest Gump in his beard stage. He looks like he's 47 but he runs like he's 25. And he could do that for most of the race, uphill, downhill. He'll pace himself. He knows that he's probably not gonna catch somebody who's bombing down the hill as fast as these guys are, but he knows he could still do some damage in the points to everybody else, because right now he's in third position. Now I'm not gonna sign off on the Ryan Woods looks 47 part. I'm gonna call him a spring chicken. I think he looks great. And Ryan, you heard me say that. So as we see the men the men's field ascending back up. We are looking for our lead women, and I think we have Lindsay Webster right there passing a number of elite men as she makes her way from that 15-minute gap up the next ascent, and that's Ian Hosek right there, followed by Aaron Newell. And here's Lindsay again, starting to power off again like we talked about, like the little video game, picking people off, gaining points, climbing up that hill, and she's able to kind of gauge how fast she's going by how how quickly she's passing these other men. And now I don't see Nicole Merkel back there. And for Nicole, this has to be concerning. Nicole has two concerns in this race. One was to try and beat Lindsay Webster because if Lindsay gets first and Nicole gets second, they're now tied in the series. But Nicole has a lot more to worry about now because now she also has to beat Rhea Coble or she loses her series lead. And there is Rhea Coble right there who we talked about being primed for this race, one of the best climbers He's going to loop in the, the leaders. world. He's going to loop with the leaders. He's going to amount of mountain biking to keep herself healthy. And as you can tell, she does not, she will, is the one person that might run every inch of this mountain. She doesn't really power hike. But you can see how small her strides are when she does that. She doesn't gain as much ground sometimes as if people are power hike, even though she's in that run. This is what I was talking about with people with shorter legs are actually better for climbing. She has these little tiny strides, but she doesn't have to use as much leverage and stretch out those hamstrings and calves as much so she can keep that pressure on. Now, the big thing for Rhea here is she is playing spoiler. If Rhea takes second today, then Nicole Merkel now needs Rhea's help in the final race of the season. If Nicole gets second, then all she has to do is beat Lindsay in any position. But if but if Rhea takes second, then Nicole Merkel will count on Rhea also beating Lindsay. Both of them would have to beat Lindsay in the final race of the year. You did your homework, didn't you? Just thinking about it. Just a little bit. This is the big thing right here is the points and how they shake out. This is your spoiler. Yep. As well on the men's side, we talked about Robert Killian was eager to be a spoiler in this one. Ryan Woods is showing it right now being in third position. And Johnny Luna Lima at fourth place could do some serious damage and bump people all over the place if he continues to maintain that lead. Long legs. Ryan Atkins has hit that fire road that we were talking about. And the thing that's different about this as opposed to normal races, typically when you hit this section of the race, you're relieved, you're excited, you're happy, you can go fast. But your legs have taken such a beating at this point that they're almost numb. You can barely feel them. You're just trying to keep them underneath you. And I jinxed Rhea Coble. There she is down on her knees now. Well, I mean, this is an incredibly steep section. Yeah. As you look at the angle of that, that hill, as this is armor. Armor is just pick up by the chain, this giant ball, kind of like an Atlas stone-sized ball around the flag and take it back. Just taxes your hips, taxes your quads, taxes your back, taxes your grip. Nothing too challenging for athletes like this, though. It taxes your groin. Once they start getting down into that gauntlet area towards the bottom, and the electrolytes start to fade out, and the body is more prone to cramping, an Can obstacle like that right? or other ones similar on could line. send someone's body into full body right. cramps and actually right. put them on the ground, unable hey, to run. Hi. All right, no Rhea Coble saying today. something. Thank she's you. directing traffic to some of the people that are in front of her, some of the men that are a little slower, and she's letting them know, I want that one on the end that has a little higher box that allows her to set up her hands for the twister. Now, any of you men who are going to be running in the elite wave, when you get passed by leading women, 
the key is, for respect in the sport, you need to step aside and let them go. Don't obstruct them, don't get in their way. It can be incredibly frustrating to be a leader out in the women's race and have to wait for a man from the previous wave. So, always give them the lane, let them take it. She's smoking through this thing. And she's gonna run by anyone that was in front of her anyways. And she had to deal with another athlete who was swinging kind of wildly next to her. That could have easily knocked her off, so it was good that she was able to maintain her poise and not miss that bell. And there's the first water we've seen on this course. It had been raining here for a few days, so they're getting to a couple areas where it could be a little muddy. Rhea Coble taking that descent casually. She recovers on the descents. A lot of the women try and really push the pace that are around her. Nicole Marigold, for example, or Lindsay Webster will push the downhills. Rhea hammers the uphills and then recharges on the downhills. As you can see, Atkins here heading into Bender in second position. So Dave, what do you do for your birthday this year? Uh, I went out to dinner. I was actually out of the country, so I went out to a nice little dinner. Nice little dinner. Today is Rhea Coble's birthday, and she was excited to have as many hills on her birthday as she could possibly get. So I think she got her present and her gift today. If I know anything about Rhea Coble, it's that she loves two things. She loves running mountains, and she loves eating giant heaping portions of food. Oh, I was just about to say that. She eats more than anybody I've ever seen. I've seen her put away an entire watermelon by herself in one sitting. <laughs> Well, here she is at the eight-foot box, and you can see her technique is she's actually climbing it like a rope climb, even pinching the ball, the knot at the end of the rope with her feet so that she can use her legs to climb over that eight-foot box. And maybe that's because she's a little bit smaller, maybe conserving some of her body energy. But regardless, up and over and into the next ascent. This is an obstacle that's new to Spartan and has been giving a lot of people trouble, and they don't know how to approach it. So if you just saw what she did there, that was pretty textbook, and you could use that example for yourself in your own race. That's Ryan Atkins making his way down this fire road right now, trying to pull back Johnny Luna Lima, who sits in first position. And in third right now, that's the big battle. Who's going to take third? Will it be Ryan Woods, Tyler Veerman, Aaron Newell, or someone else? Ian Hosick. Hosick's in there. We got a really good mix of men chasing that final podium spot as well. It all depends how close they are when they get down to that final gauntlet. To, you know, is there a Miss Spear? Does and who's somebody, got legs left? Yeah, who, I mean, who falls off the rig? Does somebody just go into massive cramps after the, the bucket carry? We just don't know. But right now what you can see is Rhea Koval trying to nail out a podium finish here today. She wants the win. She took the win here last year, but Take it down, Lindsay Webster is a tall order. And she stole the win last year from Lindsay. Lindsay was in the lead. Lindsay missed her spear by about an inch low. And Rhea came up right behind her as Lindsay was banging out burpees, nailed her spear, and went on to the win. And, and that's the thing. We still have a spear throw coming up in this race. So things could shake out a little bit differently. That's the one obstacle where you have to be precise. You only get one try. And it tends to shake up races pretty dramatically. And to, again, to, you know, to look ahead to that spear, it is right before, is right after, brother, the tire flip. And that tire flip takes just a lot of grip. It takes a lot of upper body strength. It takes a lot of back strength. And ironically enough, those are a lot of the same muscles that you use in the spear throw. So that tire flip can affect your throw after all this running as well. Well, another descent. Up and down. There's not a lot of flat on this course. You got ups and you got downs, but the flats are coming in the women's race. The men have just hit them, and uh, you know they're excited about it, an opportunity to try to use some of that speed and make this course go by a little bit quicker. <laughs> Something that's been going by quickly, too, is spectators on the ski lifts going up the mountain to spectate from the top. That's <laughs> That's got to be difficult to watch when you're running up this mountain. You see people whizzing past you on the ski lift. Well, one big descent here from Rhea Coble, and then I believe here she's going to round the corner and head back up again after the next few switchbacks. Ponytail bobbing up and down kind of matches her personality. She's one of the most... Uh, fun-loving, approachable, nicest people that you want to meet in the sport. Her and her husband, Bun, moved out to Colorado last year so she could live and play in the mountains a little bit more and 
it certainly not only affected her, the happiness in her life, but her training as well. She gets to train at altitude a little bit more than some of her other competitors. So she makes it look so easy, doesn't she? When you love what you do, everything's just a little bit easier, right? Yeah, it's true. It's true. And most of the athletes here, they really are passionate about this sport. They live and they breathe mountain running, obstacles. And here's where I'm talking about that hairpin turn that's going to happen. They're going to take a hard left and go right back up this thing again. Just another steep, nasty climb. Speaking of that lifestyle too, you know, we obviously we've been talking about Nicole Miracle a lot. She just bought a sprinter van and just souped it up with a bed inside, with lights, with a kitchen, all the comforts at home. So she could drive around the country doing all the outdoor athletic sports that she likes, as well as getting herself to Spartan races. <laughs> so I know some of you at home are probably thinking, wow, this is crazy, this race is so long, and yet while wow, all they're doing is going up and down mountains, this looks miserable. Well, if you haven't run a Spartan race yet, you should start with a sprint, do something small. Then, of course, there are supers, a little bit longer, and finally you get to the beast. But please note, this is one of the most extreme beasts that we have out there. There are other beast courses that are more running heavy, less power hiking, less mountains, and I would start there. This is... This Big Bear course is the stuff of legends. This is what you take on when you're looking for a new challenge. This is one of the two most difficult courses in North American Spartan racing. Uh, the other one is Killington in Vermont. So this is kind of being called you know, the Killington of the West. And like you said, this is certainly not the one that you start off with, though I'm sure some people do. And wherever you do a Spartan race, the terrain of whatever geographic region you're in will be represented in the race. Now here's Rhea Koble talking about training in the mountains and her love of it in her own words. I feel like my life is pretty much big bear training and for like a few weeks leading up to that race, I can actually call it that because I run probably around 3,000 feet of gain on every run that I do and sometimes I go up to 5,000. So it's really, this is the race that I train for. I don't train for big bear, I just love to train that way. I love running up the mountains, I love the views from the top, the sending down, like things like that just make me so, so happy. And so while I don't really change my training for races specifically too much, than having a race that just fits it so perfectly. It's just like, it makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, well, she certainly loves training in the mountains, Kevin. She loves this extra steep climb right here where she feels like she could really put some time between herself and her competition. Right now, an opportunity for her to reel Lindsay Webster back in. And this is a spot where she could do it because she's not going to do it on the descents. So she knows every time she hits one of these climbs, she has to make up time and she has to make up ground. It's truly unbelievable the way that she just continues to click off this tempo, light on the toes. The pressure that her calves must be taking this entire way up is really impressive. And right when I say that, she switches to the power height. Yeah, this is the most power hiking I've seen her do as you're taking a look at those calves right now and have just how muscular and how fit she is. She's also wearing gaiters there, and those gaiters are an important tool in her arsenal. That's what's keeping those rocks, that gravel, that sediment, for getting into her shoes, which could cause those blisters I was talking about earlier. So uh, definitely a smart equipment choice by her for this course today. Well, it looks like Rhea Koble is about to ascend up to the top of that steep climb, but there's another little pickup here before she gets to the end of it. An opportunity to raise her tempo a little bit, and you can see just how shattered some of the people in front of her are getting through this course so far, and they're just about getting to the halfway point. Many of the athletes today that are starting at 12 o'clock will be required to go out there with headlamps because they'll be expected to be finishing this race in the dark. And don't be surprised to see a number of athletes in the open heats have to be removed from the course if they don't pass certain time cutoffs in time because once it gets dark out there, your safety can't be insured. And while it's going to take the best 
men and women in this race, two to two and a half hours to finish. The average person's gonna take six, seven, eight hours to finish as Johnny Luna Lima just passes the eight mile marker and he is now two thirds of the way through this course. Yeah, I don't think he's gonna need a headlamp today. He's probably not gonna need the headlamp. Um, you can see that most of the top, top athletes are barely carrying even any water or supplies. They just basically have a few gels or goos or gummies with them for fuel and they're counting on the water stations to be enough for them. Yeah, if you could look at Ray and Koba as a pack right there, and as she runs by a little bit, you could see little kind of blue packets in that meshing right there. So they'll pop one of those like every mile, maybe at the top of the hill after they've exerted a lot of energy and a lot of sugar and kind of replace those nutrients that they lost so that later in the race, they don't start to bonk. I mean, and believe it or not, this is a climb. This is still a little hill that Luna Lima's going up. Otherwise, you'd be seeing him really extend that stride. The shorter, tighter stride indicates that even if you can't see on camera, he is still ascending right now. The same with Rhea Koval. That doesn't look like a lot of hill, but that is still a hill she's going up. And those climbs are sneaky, because it's not like the really steep one where you could run at a really slow pace, and you know that you're not gonna go too fast. These gradual uphill climbs, they hurt you a lot because you have to still run them fast, but you're still going uphill. You can't hold back at all because it's flat enough to run really fast, but it still hurts. Yeah, so you can see right there, there's enough of an incline there, maybe like four or five percent incline, that it just takes your legs. It might even be more than that. But Luna Lima has found his tempo here. He seems to be really happy with this exact amount of resistance from this hill. And, and he's continuing to run a very high speed. He looks comfortable. If you look at his face, if you look at his arm swing, if you look at his posture, there's nothing amiss there. And in a race this long, it's very easy as you see people going up the ski lifts, going past Rhea, probably at almost the same speed. That is just impressive how fast he's able to run up these hills. But getting back to Johnny Lima in the lead for him, you can get lulled into a false sense of confidence and start to back off a little bit when you don't see any other athletes around you. So it's kind of like spooky knowing that you're being hunted right now, but you can't see who's hunting you. Well, to me, it appears that Luna Lima is still ah! pulling away, which is the most impressive thing about it. When we talked about Veerman and his lead earlier today, and we thought maybe it was a bit ambitious, maybe a little too aggressive early on, and Luna Lima waited until a couple climbs in to make his move. He sat back early on and let the field destroy itself. His move, on the other hand, although incredibly aggressive, seems to have been appropriate because he shows no signs of wear and tear. And he did it where he was most apt to, and that was on those downhills. And when look how happy, happy <laughs> Rhea Kobla is right now on her birthday climbing up this hill. And we told her before the race, no birthday burpees. The goal is no birthday burpees. So, so far a clean race out of Rhea Koble and so far a happy Rhea Koble. And if you're happy doing something this hard, it makes it so much easier on you. Because right now, so many people are in this pain cave in a world of hurt, and she's out there for her. It's like a stroll in the park. Well, Luna Lima doing a full stop to grab water before heading up and over this wall. And this is a is new version yeah, of what's called the Stairway to Heaven. They, Stairway to Sparta rather, they added rock climbing grips on there so it taxes your grip and your upper body muscles a little bit more as opposed to just kind of like boosting up that wall. And now another long descent for Luna Lima. So Did you really see that little move there though? He just hit that rock and boosted all the way over that ditch. So for him to be running that aggressive with that much power at this point in the race is telling. Now, Luna Lima knew that he had the luxury of taking a little walk there, a little sip of water, and yeah, breathing and just re recharging a little bit because that, no one's going to gain on him on that next downhill. Yeah. They're not. They're not. And so right now, what we have is really a battle for second. Is Ryan Atkins maybe shifting from trying to win this race to trying to just hold off the guys behind him? Because he's got some big dogs chasing him. Ryan Kempson, Ryan Woods, Ian Hosek. These guys are all after him right now. I just always go back to that race that he ran at the World Championships last year, where he was so far behind, and then before you knew it, at the bottom of the mountain, he almost caught first place. And again, with all the obstacles down there, including like we talked about, the spear, the rig, and some of those other ones, you never know what could happen. So for him, it's try to keep his 
fast and pace as you can go. When we're, we're talking about Ryan Atkins right now, and hope that maybe maybe Johnny Luna Lima <laughs> makes a mistake somewhere in that gauntlet. Now this is an amazing section Luna Lima is going to come across because he's going to round a reservoir at the top of this mountain, and on the other side of that reservoir, hopefully we get a good look at it. A mountain range snow-capped the entire way. So this side, the sunny side of the mountain, that side, almost like the dark side of the moon. And Ray's lining up here for a very steep wall. She yeah. struggled with walls in the past at the top of the hills, but she nails this one on the first try. That's a good sign for her. She's looking really smooth. And these walls are where you can cramp up a little bit. Your calf could cramp or a groin could cramp swinging over the top, but no ill effects there. And you can see she's happy about she's that. She's claiming it because she knew she struggled with that in the past. And yet on the first shot was huge for her. And these are those snow-capped mountains in the distance I was talking about. It's an absolutely breathtaking view as you come around this bend. And of course, the flattest section of the entire course. So an opportunity to really get out and roll. You feel good about this part. You feel good about being able to get your speed up, let your legs feel a little better. And the views really provide a little extra energy. And though it's not a hot day, this sun at altitude will do a number on you. So for these athletes, when they run shirtless with as, or with as little clothing as possible, this really allows your skin to evaporate. Your skin is your body's greatest cooling system. And because of the temperature and because of the way this course is set up, these athletes are really able to maintain a, a healthy, safe body temperature, even though they're working this hard. Man, Atkins still only about a minute 10 behind Luna, Luna Lima right now, and just lurking, still there, still present, and we know that with flat sections, or maybe a, a good obstacle dense section, he could pull himself right back into the thick of things. Yeah, he couldn't see Luna Lima right there, but he was right in the mix, he's still right there. Up ahead right here, oh. Luna Lima, making his presence felt today in race four of the Spartan U.S. National Series here from Big Bear, California. He is holding first position, and he's been top five on the season in the rankings all season long. He's going to rocket, shoot up those standings pretty dramatically if he pulls this thing off today as we finally get a Nicole Miracle sighting. Yeah, it's, it's rare to see the person who is in the lead of a national series that's this important. It's the first time we've seen her in a while. And she's looking pretty strong. She had a leg injury, some kind of, it was undisclosed. She wouldn't say what it was, but she did get hurt within the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was a question mark on how well she was gonna perform today, but she's looking pretty strong. Sometimes missing a couple of weeks of training is a good thing because it allows you to really recharge, replenish, and come into a race fresh. Because a lot of these athletes are not good at holding back and tapering and resting. They're just so baked into training constantly. As you can see Beater here, these are swinging, rotating monkey bars. They look almost like egg beaters. And look how easy Luna Lima made that look, huh? It's not that easy because every time those bars swing, it kind of wants to pull you right off. So it showed a lot of grip strength right there, and he went through there about as easy as possible. Nicole is trying to boost up this wall. Yeah, it's hard for it to pop in the legs to actually jump, so she's trying to figure out how to use the block. Well, one, ascending up, um, ascending one of these at the top of one of these huge climbs, very draining, and she manages to use the kick plate to her advantage and get up and over. But also, in general, we just found out she is now trailing Rhea Koble. She is behind, so Koble's managed to pull away, and it's a couple minutes up to Rhea Koble. Mm -hmm. That's a big gap right now. While Nicole was hurt, she actually started a, a new career as an amateur electrician, doing all the wiring in her sprinter van, and she had the pictures up on social media. And it was pretty impressive to see how well she was able to do that. Um, I looked at it, and all I saw was wires and confusion. And for her, it made sense. Now, this is the rope traverse, also known as the Tyrolean traverse. And what he's doing is an itsy bitsy spider technique of sorts, alternating the leg that's on there. A lot of athletes will just drag one leg on that rope, but it can cause very severe rope burns. This is a lot of lats and biceps and grip to go with groin, potential groin cramping, that interior rotation of the foot can cause your groin to cramp up when you're under a lot of muscle fatigue. 
Yeah, if you've been to a lot of Spartan races, they're what's called tyro burn. And then people have them in the back of their cabs if they slide in there a little too much. There's another technique that they could use where they actually go on top of the rope. It's more of like kind of a Navy SEAL commando style. But if you're not wearing a shirt, you'll get a terrible rope burn going up your chest. So. It's also much slower. It's safer, but slower. Exactly. Very deliberate, but yep. if you need to make up time, that is not the way to do it. No. That's a technique that you would use if you have a tremendous amount of grip strength obstacles after it that you wanted to save your grip on. So today wasn't a day that you're probably going to see it. As Nicole now starts to hammer down her hill, as Atkins is still hanging in there with Johnny Lunalina. He needs it. I mean, right now, Atkins knows that he needs to hold off the men behind him more than he needs to catch Lunalina because Luna Lima will not be able to overtake him if Atkins runs a top two finish in the final race of the series. But if Atkins were to drop another two or three spots, that opens the door for everybody. Now Atkins is wearing tights here, so he could use a more of a sliding technique if he choose. I'm interested to see what he does there. He's going to do the alternating technique back and forth. And he's so strong in the upper body. Each of those pulls is getting him there so quickly. And it was just easy, making it look easy. And, you know, in the old days of Spartan, that used to be a much longer pull. We remember the days yeah, when it used to be like 80 feet. Uh, right down. now, more manageable, more realistic, I think. And that is still Nicole Miracle clicking off that tempo, trying to catch up to Rhea Coble and then up in the front, Lindsey Webster. He used to also be over freezing cold water as well. So if you went down, even if you completed the obstacle and went down, you still went to the drink. Yeah, it, it was. On the top of a mountain, you're going Go into the water out, there, and then having to descend can cause you to cool down, cramp up very, very easily. Which makes that lake swim, for those of you that have seen our race in Lake Tahoe, so difficult because they always have this lake swim at about 8,000 feet up the mountain. This is a big descent for the women's field right now, and with Nicole Merkel trying to track down Rhea Coble, this is a prime opportunity for her to squeeze that gap in, tighten it a little bit, and make this more of a race. We do have a spear throw still upcoming. That could really shake things up for them. And traditionally, Nicole, Rhea, and Lindsay have not been strong on the spear. They've been better over the last couple seasons, but it's still not something I would call a strength for them. I would not call any of them consistent on that yet. And that is one of the things that's been plaguing the women's field as a whole, is we haven't seen a lot of consistency on the spear throw. So that could be a major factor today. Lindsay Webster, though, her goal is, of course, to get there with such a big lead that it doesn't even make a difference. And Nicole has been privy to that this year as well. If you remember in Jacksonville, she won the race by about seven minutes, so she knows all about that. And that's the last thing she wants Lindsay Webster to be able to do to her. Right now you can see she's breaking a little bit, and that's because it's a little bit rocky here and dicey as she makes this turn, this little descent. And then she has that opening stretch of trail where she's gonna get to run that slightly downhill, flat, fast section. And Johnny is back on another climb. Luna Lima in first position ahead of Ryan Atkins in second. And then we think it's Ryan Woods, R Tyler Veerman, and uh, Ian, Hosek. Ian Hosek. Yeah. Sitting in three, four, five. And this is about a time that where Johnny Luma Lean. Johnny Luma Lima. One of these days, I'm going to get his name right on the first try. He is starting to probably count down these climbs. You know, like, okay, I'm at, like, climb number eight. I'm at climb number nine. And he starts counting them down, getting towards the finish, kind of giving himself a little mental check to help boost his morale. It's a world-class performance he's putting on today. His running uphill style is somewhat odd and yet very effective at the same time, very efficient. And you can see Nicole Miracle, she's hitting the last little bump up here before she gets that long, fast fire road descent into Bender. And Bender's another one of those obstacles. It's, it's not one that an athlete of Nicole's ability or anybody really in the elite wave is going to fail. But again, a rhythm breaker that's going to force them to use those upper body muscles in a little different way. They have to swing their leg over the top. It's just an opportunity for when they come down and land on the ground that it could start the chain reaction of cramping. Well, Luna Lima shows no signs of that so far, and neither does Miracle. 
as they make their way through this segment of the course. And Miracle is still sitting in third position. She's chasing Rhea Koble and, of course, first place Lindsay Webster over this next section of the course. But this is a kind of area where she could make up significant time, at least over Rhea. You just took the words right out of my mouth, especially for how long it is. This is where she could really hammer down. I mean, she was a Division I track star at Rice down in Texas. This is her style of running. This is what made her, what gave her the advantage in those first two series races that were mostly on flat ground. So I'm sure she's very excited to be where she's at right now. So Luna Lima looking like he's finally cresting this hill. And now an opportunity, again, a huge downhill. Which he's just shown today, it's been one of these performances where all of a sudden you thought Ryan Atkins was the best ascender on the planet at least in Spartan race, where Johnny Luna Lima is now made the world go on notice, saying, hey, I could close down a hill with the best of them. And the name that we haven't heard as much of today on the men's side that, that uh, we m did not mention before is Ryan Kempson is actually sitting in fourth position right now. So right now, the order shakeout on the men's side is Luna Lima in first, Ryan Atkins two, third place Ryan Woods, fourth Ryan Kempson and fifth, Ian Hosek right now. The women's side, Lindsey Webster in first, Rhea Koval in second, Nicole Miracle in third. And Tyler Veerman and Kirk DeWitt are still fighting for that fifth spot as well. There, there's, a, there's a big cluster of men in that three, four, five, six, seven, eight position because you still have Aaron Newell in the mix. You still have a few other guys that have Robert an Killian's in that mix. Robert Killian is in that mix. And we've been wanting to call his name a bit more today. And this is a course where he typically does very well. But th there's a new class of the field today on this mountain races, and it's Johnny Luna Lima. Yeah, and you talked about you know how well he's still pushing through this race. I had an opportunity to speak to his sister, and she was telling me about just how disciplined he is in every facet of his life. He's disciplined with his nutrition. He's disciplined with his training. He never skips any kind of workout that he has planned. And just that he's just such an overall good guy as well. Um, it just shows you the, ki the kind of person he is and the discipline necessary to do well at a course like this and to give him the strength to continue to do what he's doing because he's put in the work. Yeah, you've seen him improve each and every race over the last few races of the series to the point that now he's imposing his will on the field. And he's leaving Ryan Atkins as a bit of an afterthought when we came into this race wondering if anybody had the ability to even have a chance of beating Atkins. Yeah. And he's got some motivation too. His entire family came out for this race. His That's sister is visiting from Ger Germany, his sister Ariana, his little brother, came to the race with his parents so they're all down there at the bottom and they got to be like they got to be waiting for him to pop out at some point i'm sure they have no idea where it is and when he comes out of the woods and if he happens to be in first and they see them they're going to go nuts well that might have been Rhea Koble that we spotted up ahead i thought it looked like her and then you saw the way that nicole kept glancing over before she picked up that ball that might be Rhea Koble that she's reeled in and we're going to get an opportunity to get a look at that in a moment. And she saw her. This is an opportunity for her to really kind of turn on the Jets. At this point in the race, they've already been about six miles in. They probably have about four to five climbs less left. So it's a little, it's an opportunity for them to say, hey, you know what? I've gotten through so much of this race so far. I'm feeling pretty good. I don't have to necessarily worry about burning out at this point. So if I could put on a little bit more time in a spot that I'm at more adequate at, I'm gonna do it. And again, Luna Lima just out there on an island all by himself, trying to hold off the field. This descent is probably one of the most exciting parts of the course because you really get to get your legs underneath you. And again, they, they turn over very, very quickly. But at the same time, it's a very different sensation and it does tear up your quads. This is one of those courses that's so interesting because generally we see a lot of these races and it's there's packs of runners very close together. In a race like this, they get so spread out, it's almost like they're on a long training run by themselves as Johnny hops over the inverted wall. Nicole is used to doing a lot of these runs with her dog Benji. You know, like so right now it's almost like she's out kind of like on a training run with her dog at the pace that she's going being all by herself. Now Johnny just passed the 10 mile marker. He's got about two and a half miles left. So 
I'd be surprised if Johnny isn't done with this race in about 20 minutes. So 20 minutes left of effort. He's about an hour 45 in right now. And the people behind him might be getting a little desperate. This is someone who might be starting to get a little desperate as she approaches Bender. Nicole Miracle wondering if she is going to be able to catch Rhea Koval or not and keep her season alive. Right now, her entire season winning this championship series depends upon being able to beat Rhea Koval here today. It, it's so important. She has to do that to maintain her lead or at least a tie of it in the series. But that is not Rhea Koval in front of her right now. That's another member of the men's field. So as she works her way up Bender, Interesting technique, looping the leg over the top. She'll hike it and roll the top. She's got her work cut out for her in the next couple of descents. Yeah. And again, as great a climber as she is, that's not something that's going to trip her up, but it is going to break her rhythm. And that's not something that she wanted when she was in a spot in the race that had a lot of wide open flat running to have something like that slow her down. Well, here's Johnny making his way up the next climb. Johnny Luna Lima all out by himself in first position, but Ryan Atkins still lurking behind as he makes his way over the inverted wall. Still a time gap inside two minutes, which means this lead is not safe. What this means is Luna Lima still gonna have to run a clean race the rest of the way. Absolutely, because Ryan Atkins right there and he's not backing off, as Nicole is not backing off either. You know, we talk so much about Lindsay and Ray in this race, and this is the woman that is leading the U.S. National Series and looked unbeatable after the first two races. And then once Lindsay Webster beat her in Seattle, it changed the entire momentum of the whole series and made the series leader an underdog going into this race. And it makes you wonder, you know, you think about, wow, that downhill speed is unbelievable for Luna Lima. Still got it. But it makes you wonder about, um, was it Lindsey Webster that looked vulnerable for the first two races, or was it just how talented Nicole Miracle is and was running and, and how special her efforts were? But once you saw Lindsey Webster return to form and once you saw that, that Miracle was beatable, it really did shift the perspective for everyone in this series. Yep, it was kind of like being in a, you know, like, if it's the NFL and there's a team that's going undefeated for the first couple of games and then all of a sudden, you know, they lose a game and they kind of get, I wouldn't say exposed, she wasn't exposed in that race, but it was just another team came out and did really well and it, it gives you pause. The Spartan U.S. National Series this year also started a month earlier. So that might have been part of a case where Lindsay Webster was just still trying to build up her fitness at that point. Totally possible. I mean, the style of the race has changed from very flat and fast to a little bit hilly and muddy to extremely long hill grind. So we're getting the most versatile athlete will come out with the series championship, which is a huge thing when you look at it. The other thing to keep in mind is just in general, we're approaching the championship season. These courses are starting to resemble championship courses more and more. Yes, this is more representative of what you will see at North Lake Tahoe in September for the World Championships. This is arguably a harder course than the World Championships. Arguably. Depends on the length of the World Championship course. If they do what they did a few years ago where it was actually 17 miles, that, that does change things a little bit. But if they keep it in that traditional 13-ish mile beast range, then this is a more significantly challenging course. Yeah, I had the joy of running that course, and uh, that beat me up pretty good, those 17 miles. It was absolutely brutal. As we're watching Johnny still here hammer away, he has been running, his mother told me, since he was two years old. And he started to run, they said, before he started to crawl as they approached a, a downhill Z-wall here, which is very interesting. Z-wall, not the most complicated of obstacles, but something that makes people nervous because you just see mistakes happen here. We saw two athletes 
fail it in Seattle. We watched Ryan Kent fail this obstacle, and we watched uh, B.J. Jones BJ go Jones. down it simultaneously. It's what cost B.J. the victory, and, and both of them still managed to get on the podium. That tells you something about their fitness, but also about anyone can fail this obstacle, especially if it were raining today. Imagine. We have uh, reports of snow coming in the middle of the night here. So tomorrow that obstacle could be incredibly dangerous. And tomorrow is actually going to be the, one of the races in the mountain series. It's going to be a sprint here. And there's a lot of these athletes that are running today that are going to be doubling up and racing again tomorrow. Yeah, there'll be a, quite a few that will race in that that national se or in that mountain series. That mountain series will be brought to you by the U.S. Air Force, which is pretty cool to see them continue to be involved all this time with Spartan. Um, but that race will be a sprint course, about five miles, but very, very mountainous, hilly, intense five miles. And their special forces are in the venue today as we, we see Ryan Atkins hanging in there, hands on the ground, climbing up this very steep section. Boy, he sure looks like he's starting to run out of gas, isn't he? But he, he manages to, to continue to push despite that. He, he often looks pretty banged up and pretty rough and then just manages to push out these incredible Herculean efforts. And Johnny, very playful there with the tongue sticking out after he came out what looked like a tube in a playground as he approaches a much more difficult obstacle than what it looks like with this table. And he explodes over that and makes it so easy. We've seen so many athletes try to boost over that and then fall back underneath that table. Yeah, but the, he made it look like cake. Vertical cargo net 2.0. Big shift. That table caused a number of athletes to have to retry that obstacle three or four different times in Seattle in race three of the National Series. And especially at the end of a race where you have to muster up all that explosive strength, it can be incredibly challenging. It's hard to boost up, and for every time, Nicole Miracle struggled with that. It took her about three or four times before she finally got it in Seattle. We saw Ray Coble using this very kind of funky gymnastics backwards technique to get herself up. Another big ascent coming from Luna Lima, and he's just inspecting his hands. I don't All know right, if he got some uh, splinter or something in him or a thorn. Or, but, but he just continues to drive with an incredibly high tempo up these climbs. He's relentless. He hasn't, he hasn't slowed down. He, you know, he really hasn't shown any chink in his armor today. It, it makes you think, you know, why is it taking so long for this version of Johnny Luna Lima to come out and have a race and a performance like he's having right now? I was thinking the same thing, and it's it's curious. Sometimes it's just a matter of putting in the time and, and getting the experience, and then something clicks because it was this way for Ryan Woods a few years ago where he just didn't have it all put together. And then when it clicked, he was just unbeatable for the whole year. And I don't know if you noticed, but Nicole Miracle just ran past someone stretching Often, athletes will cramp up on courses like this and have to stop and stretch it out. The anaerobic effort, that muscular effort, just takes a massive toll on these athletes. As Atkins passes through the tunnel, oh, we get a nice inside view of the tunnel right here. There you go. And then he'll go into that, uh, that tabletop vertical cargo net 2.0. We kept it rated G there. It was just dark enough so he didn't have to look at Ryan Atkins' butt the whole way through that tube. <laughs> Now Atkins is not the kind of athlete who's going to be tripped up by an obstacle like this. His rock climbing ability is far too high. You know, getting back to Johnny a little bit as uh, Ryan again, just like Johnny, had no problem hopping up over that table. He, you know, he took third at the Morzine Feast last year, which is a very difficult race over in Austria. And he was also 11th at Lake Tahoe last year in the World Championship. So he has been there, he has been on the cusp. And this year, like you said, it just the, the timing of his training just seems like it's, it's hitting on all cylinders at this point. I believe he took third at the European Championships as well. I believe that was Morzine. Oh yeah, 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 Morzine, excuse me. Uh, yeah, so he's he's been there, and that Austria course is no joke. And right in front of Nicole here is one of our athletes. His name is Hannibal. And he, he had the long dreads coming back down. He competes all over the world. You'll see him at Spartan races everywhere. And he's someone who's very capable, very good. And there is Nicole running him down with a lot of miles left to go in this race. Now the hurdles, no problem for Johnny. And he is now out over a little snow mound here. Look, this, there's still a little bit of snow out on this mountain yet. 
that's got to be refreshing running over that cold snow after you've been on this just kind of hot mountain throughout the day. It's just fun. It looks really yeah. cool. <laughs> so, again, these fire roads, the opportunity for Nicole Merkel to maybe claw back Lindsey Webster a little bit. And you can see Atkins maybe conceding victory right here, looking back now and being more concerned with what's behind him than what's in front of him. As Luna Lima now into the Atlas carry. Across to the other side, five burpees, and then has to bring it back. And as, as simple as this obstacle looks, again, it's, it's, it's heavy, but it's not something that's very complicated. This could be something, again, that could just cramp up your groin, your calves, your legs just enough as he goes down and has to lift this off the ground. Savvy move, by the way, facing uphill for the burpees does make the burpee easier. It's, it's very smart, absolutely. It's, Last one. After a while, these, these athletes, they just yeah. start learning these little energy efficiency tricks that just help you. And when I say tricks, it's not, oh, you know, like it's it. illegal or anything, but these little things to find those tiny bits of advantage that just help you and build up throughout the, the course of a race that make a big difference after a while. This can be a race of seconds, and again, the descending ability of Johnny Luna Lima unrivaled. If you look at the pace that he's going, we're getting this shot from uh, a dune buggy of sorts. We're getting a gator driving and getting that shot, and he was gaining on it. Yep. And we're, you know, I started talking about before about what his mom was saying about how he learned, literally started running before now he started running. crawl. They used to ride their bikes and their scooters down the street. Whoop. Now normally, like the mom would be running as we, one of our cameramen went down. The mom would be running and the child be following the mom on the scooter. It was the opposite. The mom would have to ride the bike in a scooter and he would run with her down the road. Well, he's certainly showing that running ability right now because Luna Lima is probably within the last mile of this race and he doesn't look any worse for wear at this point. You see some of the athletes out here on this course are hobbling along and Luna Lima looks like he's out for a str Sunday stroll right now. And he's bounding down this hill, extending his legs as far as he go. He's not taking those choppy little steps. He's not trying to decelerate his speed. He's trying to run as fast as possible, knowing that if there's any kind of terrain in front of him that could trip him up, that he has the athletic ability to be able to quick foot it out of it. As he goes over one of these snowbank kickers that's left over from the terrain parks from winter season here. Well, that's Ryan Atkins right now, still trying to pull Lima back, but it's, it's gonna be a tall order at this point. And Nicole Merkel is kind of in the same boat, caught out in no man's land. Two women in front of her, no one behind her within really its sight. And she's got to maintain that sense of urgency because she needs to pull that second position finish. And it looks like Luna Lima is finishing up the final major descent of this course. Yeah, as you could see, he was running down into that what's called the helix. And the helix is this kind of X-shaped bar traverse that you have to manipulate your hands and your feet through and that is the start of that gauntlet right at the bottom that's going to decide the finish of this race still got a spear throw spear throw was in there tire flip we've seen tire flip become a problem for people in the past especially if it were to be like a little muddy or a little wet and helix is no guarantee either it's a little sketchy especially that plexiglass can be a little slick. It's hard to see sometimes where you're putting your feet. The The grips between the bars are very small, so if you have big hands, it's hard to fit it. But he hit the bell, and he's running now into the tire flip. Now, Luna Lima is right here near the end of this race. Just an obstacle gauntlet stands between him and the end. No major climbing left except for a bucket carry. And that's pretty insignificant when you compare it to the climbs that they've had today. Now the key is for him to get his Yokohama tire flip and try to get his head, he, and he did it, no problem. We've seen in the past some athletes with a lead as some water popped out of there as well, and there's plenty of grip under there as you, you could get your hands under, that an athlete would have a problem getting up the tire and it would give someone like a Ryan Atkins an opportunity to catch up, but he left no open ground there for him. I mean, that's a 400 pound tire that he flipped just with ease. After all that work, especially how anaerobic, again, we talked about this course has been, it's very easy for a hammy to just cramp up in a situation like that. Now Johnny Luna Lima, though, no problems right now. He has reached the spear throw, and this is his opportunity to seal this race. And there's a ton of pressure on him right now because as much of a lead as he has, he knows this is where he could put it away 
But if he misses, he opens the door wide open. And not just the door for Ryan Atkins. If he misses, he could open the door for a number of guys to come by him. And you don't lead the race like this for the last 10 miles only to drop it right here. No, no problem. Oof, no problem for Luna Lima. And I mean, I'm breathing a sigh of relief as he comes through. He's got a few obstacles to go, one of which is going to be the A-frame cargo net. Oh, excuse me, rope climb, and then the A-frame cargo net. And right behind him, you can see his father, John, his mother, Marcella, his sister, Ariana, and his brother, Alexander, chasing him down the course now as he completes the rope climb and heads to the A-frame cargo net. Luna Lima now only a few obstacles from the end. Once he comes over this net, he's got her hoist, he's got sled drag, bucket carry, rolling mud, slip wall, multi-rig. It's a lot of stuff crammed into the end. Great spectator-friendly festival area, but also a lot of muscular engagement still to go. So if you were to feel a little twinge, a little cramp coming on, that's where things could get really interesting. And there's his family cheering section along with BJ Jones to the left taking some video and cheering him on for the last set of obstacles on this course. So he's got Hercules hoist right here. This is an obstacle that makes some of the smaller guys nervous. We talked about like Orion Kempson, for example. In the past, it really bothered him because he was a little bit lighter. It was harder for him to get the bag off the ground. But I don't anticipate Johnny having any problems with this, especially if he can leverage that foot into the fence and really use that strength because he's incredibly strong. And we also have a a sandbag that he has to pull up that hasn't been sitting in sloppy, wet conditions like it did in Seattle, so it should be lighter. The bags do get heavy when they get rained on, that's for sure. Luna Lima, no problem. Quick work making it all the way to the top of the Hercules hoist, and now Sled Drag is next. He's got to run his way up the last ascent of the day, and it's really minor by comparison. Nicole Miracle out there. Still just slowly but surely passing the, the gentleman in the race in the men's elite field, and that's Ryan Atkins getting through Helix, making his way into the tire flip. And the gentleman that Nicole Miracle just passed was Ryan Kent, who is out there struggling right now. Now, the tire flip is not an obstacle that gives Ryan Atkins a lot of problems, so I don't anticipate much of an issue for him here, but he's being deliberate. He's picking his tire carefully. And the technique that you'll see him do is lowering it down onto his hands rather than trying to squeeze his fingers under it once it's already down. He's being careful that he doesn't have an issue where he can't get his fingers under it, underneath it. So it's one up and over each way, and now he's on to spear throw. And he is tired. That move right there just showed that he, when he didn't sprint immediately away from that tire, uh, the tire flip, just showed that there might be more fatigue than we expected out of him. And I tell you what, that eccentric letdown of the tire when you actually use your strength to lower it down slowly will make it harder as Johnny Lunalino is struggling now to get this sled all the way back up to the top. So the extension here, this is so much hamstring, so much back, but he's finally got that thing extended. That's an obstacle that you can lose 30, 40 seconds to somebody. It can snag, it can be a huge problem um, when you look at how that, uh, how that sled actually could get jammed up in a divot or if the rope could get caught around the court. And this is an enormous spear throw for Ryan Atkins because you still have second and third, excuse me, third and fourth very close behind him. If he misses here, this could be a difference between like 60 to 80 points in the series. So it's a dramatic opportunity for him to just clinch this second position. He needs this to lock up the series. That's a good hit for Atkins, you know. Wasn't right in the center of the bullseye, but he'll take it. And as he heads into rope climb now, he and Luna Lima are about to wrap up their races. And that's something he struggled with. It was a 50-50 before in his career. Well, Luna Lima has hit the bucket carry. This is the last time he's going to have to go up any kind of incline for the day. 180-pound bucket up and around this loop. There is one slight incline after they hit the, the dunk wall and the slip wall, but it's, it's a small one, and then it's basically to the finish line after that. I mean, if you think that 
Uh, a little climb like this is going to stop Luna Lima after the day that he's had. You must be out of your mind because right now he knows that he gets around this loop. He's pretty much got this thing in the wraps. He just needs to make no mistakes on that multi-rig coming up. And he's good to go with his first victory in the U.S. National Series. Yeah, there's also a name for a horse with a horn on its head called a unicorn. And we're not going to see anybody pass him today. That's just not going to happen. So Luna Lima making his way up the final heavy carry of the day. I mean, it's a painstaking little section here, carrying that bucket up another little kicker of a ski slope. The best part of this bucket carry is when he hits the top, he'll be able to look down and see exactly where Ryan Atkins is, and he'll be able to see how big a lead he has, and that's basically when the celebration is going to begin. I mean, at this point, it's minutes. Luna Lima has put himself minutes ahead of his competition, and he's done it by ascending and descending better than anyone we've seen in the field to date. And it's got to have a lot of people in this field very concerned. Particularly going into Lake Tahoe in September. Because if he could do what he did here today with the ascents and the downhills in Lake Tahoe, he's going to be very dangerous. There's a man who needs to be aware of Johnny Luna Lima right now, and that's Jonathan Albin. John Albin was the man who almost got caught by Ryan Atkins at the World Championships last year at the end. And now he has someone else who's just as fast, if not faster in the downhills than Ryan was. Well, there's a downhill going pretty fast with that bucket for Luna Lima. He's around the worst part of it now. And you saw Nicole Miracle knocking out Bender and making her way into the next section of the course. She's still trying to hold on to that podium position and possibly reclaim the lead in this race. But right now, the story of the day is Johnny Luna Lima as he makes his way past the mile 12 marker and into the dunk wall. And as he was going down, it was actually his father that was run, running alongside of him, cheering him on the last part of this course. And this has got to be great, hitting this nice cold water. First spot of the course where you actually get wet. And under the dunk wall right here, fully submerged, up and out, and into slip. Slip wall right here. Now last year at the slip wall at Big Bear, it was the reverse to this. It was actually facing uphill, and it created cartage for the athletes. But no problem here as he goes downhill and powers up with a tremendous amount of speed. So now Johnny Luna Lima is only a couple obstacles away from the finish line. He makes his way off the slip wall one tiny little ascent, and then it's the multi-rig, the last failable obstacle of this course. Johnny Luna Lima trying to take home the W. He's already celebrating. He knows he's got it, but he needs to be cautious on this multi-rig. The multi-rig is never a given. It's a downhill. It'll kind of slingshot you down the hill. So if you take it a little too aggressively and you're not careful, your hands can slip off. And he is wet. You saw him just scoop a little bit of dirt off the ground and rub his hands in it. He's trying to dry those hands out. He wiped them on his pants as well. Nothing like going in with slippery hands with all the pressure in the world on you into this last obstacle, the multi-rig. And it is a harder multi-rig than the ones that they've done in previous races. This iteration of multi-rig has rings into pipes into Tarzan's. And that is his mom, Marcella, holding hands with him, cheering him down the course, reuniting and doing what they did when he was a little kid, running down the street. And here he is doing it at the end of the Big Bear Beast. So this is Johnny Luna Lima, one multi-rig away from claiming the title of champion in Big Bear in the Beast, race four of the Spartan U.S. National Series. All the way onto the pipe already, he's got one ring and three knots on the ropes that he's got to hit. He's going to skip the ropes, he's rung the bell, and now all you've got to do is make it through this barbed wire crawl. Johnny Luna Lima, only a matter of time at this point as he comes underneath the wire. This is going to be your winner today. And here is a man who learned how to run before he could crawl, and now he's crawling to the finish line for his championship moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner on your day in the Spartan U.S. National Series. He's climbed faster than everyone else here today. He's descended faster than everyone else here today, and he was flawless on the obstacles. This is your men's champion in race four in the Spartan U.S. Championship Series, Johnny Luna Lima, claiming the 300 points for victory, his first National Series championship emphatically doing it for the United States, doing it for Brazil, and he could probably tell you all about it in German. Celebrating with family.
That's his sister Ariana there, his brother Alexandra, and his parents are very close by as well. And we have Nicole Miracle bearing down on this thing, but Dave Watson, fourth member of our team, is with Johnny Luman Lima at the finish line. I'm here with Johnny Luman Lima, took first place, he's just crossed the line. How the hell are you feeling? I'm so I'm just so happy to be here. I mean, this has just been so long in the making for me. It's like it's it's just huge for me. It just means so much. It's like I take so much pride in training day in, day out, and then you see it pay off like this and it's just so special to have my, my family here and I'm just so happy and just grateful that Spartan is Spartan and that I can be here and compete. How's your body feeling, man? Is that tough? Is that a tough course? You on the descents you were flying. How's your body? Yeah, I mean, I'm beat up. There's no secret, you know. I fought, and I did my best to stay present in the moment, not get too carried away with what was going on in the race, and just one step at a time. And yeah, I, was I'm your tactic was your tactic to beat Ryan on the downhills? I guess my tactic was I wasn't sure if I was a faster climber than him, but I was pretty damn confident that I was a faster descender. And to win these races, it's, it's the law of averages. It's like you do every little thing well enough, that's how you come out on top. And that's why we have such great athletes like Ryan Atkins and Robert Killian being so consistent. Well, here's one great athlete here, Johnny Lumalima, taking out the W in the 300 points today. Johnny, congratulations, mate. Thank you. Uh, well thanks done. a lot, Dave. And Johnny Lutalima justifiably emotional after a victory today, his first in a U.S. National Series event, and to do it in front of his family, and to do it on an effort on a course this intense and this long. I mean, it's truly impressive. And here's second place, Ryan Atkins coming in a multi-rig. This is something that Ryan Atkins is going to have absolutely no trouble with, but for Ryan Atkins, this is now his third second place finish in the U.S. National Series with a win. Again, he's built a lead in the series on everybody and is putting so, this away. He's so consistent. It's just remarkable how consistent he is. When he loses, it's to someone else each time. It's not like he's losing to the same person. He led one loss to Kempson, one loss to BJ, now a loss to Johnny Ludolino. But the reality is, these aren't really losses per se, it's just He's managed to pull up second place finishes against each of these guys differently. And again today, second place in the U.S. National Series. Another podium finish for Ryan Atkins. Remarkably consistent, incredibly talented. Luna Lima's thrilled to have been able to top him because he is an unbelievable athlete. Here with Ryan Atkins, second place. He's smiling. Man, was that hard or uh, how you feeling? Yeah, that was just hard. It was, uh, I mean, the guys took it out fast, and it was just like, who could hold on? So, uh, yeah, Johnny crushed it today. I was pretty happy with how I raced. Um, yeah, was what, what was your strategy going in? I thought you did really well at not uh, overdoing it early. You know, I think a lot of athletes went out maybe a little too hard, and yeah. you paced yourself really well. What, what was your strategy going in? Yeah, I just didn't want to, like, as soon as my legs started burning, I just slowed down for, like, pretty much every climb. So I just stayed there, even though I felt like I could go a lot faster. I just held it back, and I'm glad I did, because I was pretty smashed by the end. What's your plan now, uh, going into to race five? Uh, I'm going to go eat a burger, probably. <laughs> uh, plan to race five. I don't know, just go have some fun in the mountains, and then start uh, getting ready for Utah. Fantastic job today. Ryan Atkins, the champion. Great race. It's great to see you out here. We'll see you at the next one. Well, Ryan Atkins taking second place. Oh, and then look who managed to snag a podium spot. Ryan Woodsy coming into the final little stretch of barbed wire. And you know, he missed the last race or dropped out of the last race with that hamstring issue, but it looks to be behind him. Third place, not a bad showing. This is his first podium for the, the first podium for the 2018 U.S. National Series champion. And after all the struggles he went through early in the year, for him to get a podium here is just shows what kind of competitor and what kind of athlete he is. Yeah, he's an incredible athlete, and we're looking for him to be one of the contenders in Tahoe for the World Championships. But that's Ryan Woods taking third place in race four of the Spartan U.S. National Series here in Big Bear.
big performance from Ryan Woods today, and he is very proud of his friend, Johnny Lutalino. Yeah, this this is uh, the camaraderie that you see throughout the Spartan sport. Just these athletes, they they grind together, they beat themselves up on these mountains together. So when they get to the finish, they get to share in the kind of agony they all suffered through. And then here's Ryan Kempson, who again was the first place finisher at Jacksonville, coming through with another fourth place performance. Solid performance from him. He just manages to always be around there this year. He is the real deal. Ryan Kempson, one of the best athletes in this field, conquered the mountains today, fourth place finish, just barely off the podium, but proven that his earlier races this year were no fluke. He is here to stay and ready to compete for a world championship. And this performance keeps him in podium position for the U.S. National Series. Yeah, I mean, last last race in Seattle, that really hurt. Slipping off the monkey bars, losing those points, and slipping all the way to 10th position, it was devastating for his season, but he may still end up being top two in the U.S. National Series. This fourth place finish certainly helps. Yeah, particularly with Johnny Lima back in fourth place to start the day, and Ryan Woods having no chance at the series at all, those points don't really hurt him as bad as somebody else winning with him. And he's just exhausted as he picks himself off the ground and comes to the finish. That's Ryan Kempson spent but excited. Fourth place finish here in Big Bear, California. It looks like he used just about everything. And as he and Luna Lima embrace, knowing that the day is done, we're gonna take a look at the results, and it's Johnny Luna Lima in first, Ryan Atkins in second, followed by Ryan Woods, Ryan Kempson, and Ian Hosick rounding out the top five. And now there's your women's leader, Lindsay Webster, hammering the downhill. She has just dropped the hammer on everybody today. Yeah, I mean, it, it was no surprise. It, this is exactly what people feared when they allowed her to run away with the race in Seattle, knowing that she had these kind of mountains to run up and down as efficiently as she does. You know, Lindsay Webster, her ability to climb and her ability to descend, make it so that she may end up being around the top 10 in the men's total overall times today. That's how talented she is at running mountains. Yeah, that's how fast she is. I mean, you're watching her blow past a lot of these men. And these are the men that are gonna be somewhere near the, the top 50 in the men's elite standings, and she's blowing past them already at the vertical cargo 2.0. Now that roll over the top, that's the most efficient way to do it, is get your chest over the top, kick a leg and roll. She knows all the tricks of the trade at this point. She's so much more efficient than where she was a couple of years ago. Just so much more well-rounded as an athlete, knows all the tricks of the trade. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, Robert Killian now. It looks like he's approaching the bucket, and uh, he's oh, multi-rig. Just shows, yeah, to multi-rig, I apologize. And for someone you want to talk about consistency, that is the, the captain, Robert Killian. He is near the top of the top five, and always in the top 10 in every single one of these UF Championship Series races. And then going into West Virginia in a couple months, that is his jam. That is a race that he's won two years in a row. He loves that he's course. A, yeah, and he's looking to do it for three. Well, Lindsey Webster looking to do three World Championships in a row because she's already at two. She's already won the US National Series a few times. And Lindsey Webster is thinking, I'm about to become the stuff of legends. Yeah, it has never been done. Nobody's ever won the world championship three times in a row. Nobody's won it three times, period. Hobie Call would argue with that, but uh, I agree with you. If you count the Texas World Championships, which was the first world championships in 2011. But Lindsey Webster making her ascent up the final big climb of her day. And look at her, I mean, the look on her face, she's a little bit of fatigue there, but she's still moving with a great cadence. This is very similar to what we saw with Johnny Lunalima, and like he did, getting into these little quick runs. And you can see, like, she's happy. She's still in a pretty good mood, but she is breathing a little bit harder than she was before. This is where it starts to just be agonizingly painful. You're so close to that cramp point, and you're just trying to push fast enough without overdoing it and pushing the legs into full cramp. And she just went past Brent Trail, who's won many of a spark race. So it just shows you the talent that she's blowing past right now after having a 15 minute deficit at the start. A mountain course is just so dramatically different than all the other races. The way that this mountain just takes it out of your legs, and takes your ability to run, 
it's what makes it so challenging and so special and so unique. And Spartan Race is not afraid to throw this terrain at you. And yeah, we just saw Robert Another Killian there just shot. finishing with another top 10 finish and keeping himself up there. And as far as not position for the U.S. standings, but at least in position to say, hey, I got my left mountain legs underneath me and I'm going to be ready for Utah and West Virginia. And as trail racing legend Chris Brown wraps up on the multi-rig and finishes his race today, Lindsey Webster is making her final descent into the last few obstacles of the day. Namely, she just finished the tire flip and she's heading into spear throw. This is it for Lindsey Webster. She's got it all going on right here. If she can hit this spear throw, the race is hers. And she missed this same exact spear last year. And it opened the door for Ray or Coble to steal the race away from her. And that was really good etiquette by that other athlete. That was a spear that Lindsay wanted. He gave it up so she could have the spear throw that she felt most comfortable with. Interesting technique that she's doing. She's actually pinning the rope to the spear. I've never done that myself. But I think the objective here is to keep it from being stepped on by your foot. She's gotten a lot better at that spear throw. She threw one right down the pipe. And now there's really, the only obstacle she could really fail at this point is multi -rim. That's it. I mean, she didn't hit her first spear throw until Asheville in 2016. She was so happy she was doing cartwheels because it was impossible for her for years. And now she hits it routinely, probably I'd say 75%. That's Rhea Coble chasing her into the festival area. Lindsay still has to hustle to get through these next few obstacles to claim this W, but no problem on the rope climb. Now, she's looking at A-frame, turquoise, sled drag, buck carry. That would have been a terrible jinx if I just said she missed it last year and did it again with Ray chasing her as close as she is right now. Oh man, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. You know, she's she's had trouble with it in the past, but she's been remarkably consistent with it this year, and that's been the big thing. We've wanted to see that change from her and some of the other athletes as Rhea's making her way through the helix. Slippery with that plexiglass again, but as long as you get those lateral grips, pretty solid. Yeah, Rhea being the gymnast from her past doesn't really have it. too many problems with it, even with those bleg mitts causing a little bit more uh, bulkiness in her hands. Hits the bell, no problem, goes into the tire. So now she's got tire flip, spear throw, just a few obstacles behind Lindsay Webster, but it looks like it's Lindsay's day to day. Lindsay's got to hit the her coist over here. And then again, sled drag, bucket carry, rolling mud, and then the multi-rig. That's it. That's all that's left in the day. And it's hard to believe they've run this far. They've done this many mountains. They've been out there for well over two hours, and they still have five obstacles left. Yeah, yeah. and you saw that. It was actually a little bit of a struggle for Rhea there with a kind of an uphill tire flip as Lindsay's using a very efficient technique here to get that bag up, not really taking any chances. And I got to tell you what, I'm, Rhea Koble has very quietly worked her way up the point system in the U.S. National Series this year. Yep, which well, has been consistently around that top five position even if she hasn't been winning races. And that's the thing is, in a series like this, the biggest key is stealing a spot here or there when you can. Those jumps and points are 20, 30 points here and there. Pretty dramatic. So now Rhea, her birthday, so far burpee free. Burpee free birthday, that's what she wants. Yeah. And if she could pass this, this is gonna be, gonna be the biggest test for her today. It will be the biggest challenge for her to spear throw. Not normally one of her strongest obstacles, but when you're this close to the finish and it's your birthday, maybe you got a little bit of birthday luck. Taking her time for sure. Oh, it's a tough miss for Rhea Coble. So Rhea is off to the side. She's got 30 burpees. And this just opened the door for Nicole Miracle, big and time. And that is huge, considering what you spoke about with the points earlier and how much it matters between second and third. And this is Lindsay right now, finishing the first half of her sled drag. Now it goes from all that lat strength to hamstring strength and lower back strength as you try and drive this thing back up the hill. Each pull is just agonizingly hard. It just gets heavier and heavier with each yank. Now, what she doesn't know, right now, Lindsay's under the impression, okay, I'm gonna win this race. Nicole and I are about to be tied for this series. Okay, what she doesn't know again. is that Rhea is in front of Nicole and that Rhea just missed the spear throw. So depending on how long it takes her to do those burpees, 
that's going to determine who has the lead at the end of this series. Yeah, like, where is Nicole Miracle right now? Because she's, she's close and gets to the spear while Rhea Cobo is in the middle of those burpees. It is going to put a tremendous amount of pressure on Nicole to hit. She's still knocking him out. And she's got a good tempo for him, no question about it. But Lindsey Webster on the bucket carry, Rhea Cobo on the burpees, and where is Nicole Miracle? She's somewhere on that mountain, and hopefully for her, she's descending fast because this is where she could possibly save the points for her and not fall out of first place. And yeah, we're about to see a little war here at the end. This is what's most critical. Points, the gaps, the difference between second place and third place is dramatic. They totally flipped the script, like Eminem and Lickety Split in Eight Mile with Rhea and Lindsay trading spear misses from this year to last. So now the bucket carry from Lindsay Webster. All she's got to do, pick this thing up, round the loop, and she's pretty much in the clear. Women's bucket is about 60 pounds. All buckets are now the same weight because you don't have to fill your own bucket. They're all covered with that lid. And, and she was just looking down the hill to see where the competition was. She's so strong at the heavy carries now. She's, she's a totally different athlete than where she was a few years ago. When Lindsay Webster entered Spartan Race in 2014, her first race was the World Championship in Vermont. It was one of the hardest races Spartan has ever put on. And she couldn't do some of the simplest obstacles out there and still finish in fourth place. So you knew right then if Lindsay could ever figure out how to do some of these obstacles with her gas tank that she was going to be a force. But I don't know if anybody could have predicted how dominant she would become. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible the work that she and Ryan have both put in. And it's the power couple of the sport, but she's the one that may go down as greatest of all time. They're the Bonnie and Clyde of OCR racing. Just going around the entire country of the United States doing damage wherever they go. And it looks like Lindsay Webster is about to reach the peak of this bucket carry and round the corner and make her way into the descent. She's going to move pretty quick into this finish area. And she's smiling. She's cracking smiles at the camera as she goes by. And Rhea has finished her burpees and seems to still be in second place, meaning that Nicole has not caught up to her yet. Yeah, we haven't had a Nicole Miracle sighting here at the end. We saw a lot of her in the middle of this race, but Rhea Coble is not gonna let the Hercoy stand in her way. That's a really powerful pull she's got from that leg position. So she's to the top now. Just a few, it's all the strength stuff compact. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but it went pull strength with the Hercoy, pull strength with the sled drag, and then that brute heavy carry with yep. that bucket carry. And the hamstrings and the glutes in the lower back were still engaged with the Hercoys to the sled drag. So all these together, like you said, just compound one on top of the other, making it so much difficult. And the end. taxation on grip strength. So now you go, you've wiped out the grip with all of these grip-based obstacles. Then now with a half mile of the race, the dunk wall. then you get wet and then you have to do multi-break. So if multi-break is ever dangerous, this is that time. And don't be surprised to see Lindsey Webster chicken wing the entire thing. Might be hard to chicken wing those ropes. <laughs> You're not gonna <laughs> She's only gotta with get the rings in the bar, yes, possibly. She's only gotta get one of those ropes though. So she can chicken wing the rest. We've seen some of the athletes. We actually saw, give them credit, Chris Brown actually slingshotted from the last ring all the way to the bell, so you might see that too. You might. Lindsey Webster now charging the slip wall, up and over, no problem. And now it's just multi-rig. The only thing between her and taking the lead in this series. And she doesn't even know it. She thinks she's running into a tie, is this multi-rig. Yeah. No, Rhea Cole, what a day works. for her. Yeah, oh, absolutely for Rhea Coble. For somebody who works as hard as Lindsay Webster, she sometimes she's on the end of some difficult breaks too. So this, I'm actually happy for her to get this this nice break as long as Rhea could hold on here and not make any mistakes herself. You know, Rhea. Now the thing is, Lindsay's gonna turn around once she finishes. She might see right now where Rhea is. She's gonna be screaming for Rhea Coble. And to a keep very pushing. savvy move there by by Lindsay, just like Johnny, stuck her hands into that straw and kind of that dirt, dry the hands off so that when she gets to that ring, she has a little bit more dexterity. Here she rounds this corner. This is it, the final obstacle of her day. Rhea, 
Just a few from the end. Bucket carry first. One more heavy carry and one more hill climb for the birthday girl. Why not? She's done everything else. And a second place finish today for Rhea Kobel is an amazing finish. She must be thrilled. Yeah, this is one of the hardest courses in Spartan Race, wherever you go in the world. And she has the opportunity now to finish first and second consecutive years. Now this is the big moment here for Lindsay Webster. She's got to really take her time. She's going with that two-handed grip. She's being very cautious. But she's not chicken winging. She's just going to do a lateral shimmy on the pipe. And now the question is, do she, does she have it in the hands now for the ropes? Staying up high on the rope, rings the bell. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be your winner today, Lindsay Webster, wrapping things up as she heads into the barbed wire. This has to be such a tremendous feeling, knowing that there was a lot of pressure on her. This was the race that everyone expected her to win. When you looked at the standings and you looked at the schedule, she marked this on her calendar, and so did everybody else, and she withstood the test and took on all comers and beat them. So ladies and gentlemen, race four of the Spartan U.S. National Series, the beast from here in Big Bear, the title here, the 300 points that go with it, and at least a share of the U.S. National Series lead is gonna go to Lindsay Webster as she comes through the barbed wire. Just a few more seconds and the title is hers. And just another race where her and her husband get to share a podium. Yep, another podium finish for the Atkins family as Lindsay Webster Atkins crosses the finish line. Your winner on the day and a dominant victory as she sees his lead in the U.S. National Series. Lindsay Webster just exhausted going to the ground and hopefully being meted by her husband Ryan Atkins pretty soon. There he is as Leanne Washley comes down the rope. Just another tremendous performance by the Atkins family. And as Faye Stenning rounds out the top five, we've got Dave Watson down with Lindsay Webster at the finish line. But I, ha but I have to, Lindsay, what a great race. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm so dead on my feet. Like I had to take a mustard pack like right there because I was cramping and yeah, like, man, I thought I was prepared for what the mountain had in store after doing it last year, but like it always, it just like takes it all out of you. You were so consistent today. You're so fast going uphill. Is that something you, you've specifically been training for or training on? I think that's one of my fortes, but also that for me was like a very stressful part of the race because Rhea doesn't power hike, like she runs everything. So I knew that she would be running that section. So I was just trying not to let her like close any time on me there. So yeah. <laughs> Where's your mind at right now? What are you thinking about? Are you thinking about the next race or what are you thinking about? Uh, I don't know. I think I'm just like absorbing it right now. I'm just happy it's over. Um, I think it'll be good training. I'm actually going to Italy for a sky race in a month. so. It'll be about twice as much bird as today and twice as long. <laughs> so I think this will be good training. Well, amazing, amazing job today. The fact Thank that you. the fact that you're sitting here saying it was it was uh, it was super tough just says everything. You know, a champion like yourself. So well done. Thank you. Great job. Well, thanks a lot, Dave, and congratulations to Lindsay Webster as well. Now the birthday girl right here with the smile on her face as she comes under the wire. That's Rhea Coble taking second place overall, and. Uh, I think as happy as, as Lindsay Webster was, she might be even happier. That's a great way to celebrate your birthday with a claim over the finish line, and you get to celebrate with the champion as Nicole comes in as well. Nicole Merkel taking third place, losing her lead on the U.S. National Series, but still an amazing performance out of her as well. And she still has Utah left. Yeah, it's still definitely something to be proud of as the women all get together. Cheers, she just found out that Johnny won. You can see how happy these races are for one another, the work that they put in, the time they spend together. It shows. There's so much camaraderie in this sport, so much travel, and uh, they all get really happy when somebody else does very well. So as we take a look up at the women's standings, Lindsey Webster in first position, followed by Rhea Koble, Nicole Merkel, Leanne Wastany, and Faye Stenning rounding out the top five. There's your top three right there. And of course, points updates. The women's series, Lindsay Webster is your new leader with 1,126 points, followed by Nicole Merkel, Rhea Koble, Alyssa Hawley, and Rose Wetzel. And of course, in the men's side, Ryan Atkins holding that lead, followed by Ryan Kempson, Johnny Luna Lima in third, Ryan Kent, and Kirk DeWint sitting in fifth position overall. 
Thank you all so much for joining us on behalf of Kevin Donahue, Steve Hammond, and of course, Dave Watson. I'm David Megiddo. We'll see you all in Utah.